Thank you, Madam President. As we move from one bill to the other, there's always a little bit of extra noise, but thank you. And so, um, having thanked the staff, I also want to mention that in this bill in particular, um, in finance, the state government finance bill, uh, omnibus bill, was uh, the veterans bill chaired by Senator Anderson was added into, amended into this bill. So you will note probably uh, along the way you might have seen that not there, but they are joined together. Uh, the state government uh, finance bill, omnibus bill, had a target of uh, minus $30 million, and we met our target. And I will yield to Senator Anderson to go over the veterans and military affairs portion of the bill when the time comes. Major theme of the state government as we looked at this particular omnibus bill was transparency, accountability, and efficiency. Our goal was to bend the cost curve down. We have seen state government agencies continuing to escalate in expenses and costs and budget increases, and so we were able to do that in this bill. We worked hard to be thoughtful about where we made those changes. We also did increase funding for priority areas like cybersecurity, an additional $4.6 million for that particular area. Election equipment grant account uh, for that would benefit all of Minnesota. And the Amber Alert equipment upgrades. This also has a benefit in particular to all of Minnesota, rural Minnesota as well. It's important to recognize the essential of our amber equipment and what it does for all of us. Since 2011, there have not been any budget reductions. So despite advancements in technology that gave us great promises in increasing productivity, uh, instead, we have actually seen that the state government and these budgets have been on the increase, steadily increasing and adding hundreds, even thousands more, state government employees to the state payroll. Minnesotans have not grown their paychecks. Minnesotans have not. They've had to reprioritize. Minnesotans have had to, in many cases, reduce their budgets to allow for additional health care spending. They've had to make cuts in other areas in their family budgets. I think government can do the same. I want to make a couple uh, of note. This is a fairly long bill with many individual components. I just want to touch on some of the highlights. In the past, under Governor Pawlenty's uh, governorship, uh, we had a situation where uh, agencies were uh, having dollars taken from their agency budgets and transferred over and being used for the governor's staff. We objected to that at that time, and now under Governor Dayton it continued, and so we have changed that. We have taken those uh, cash dollars from those agencies and did a direct appropriation for the governor. $9.2 million on a biennial budget. To the state auditor, uh, we repealed the enterprise fund and converted that to a general fund account, funding the audit account from general fund dollars. Uh, of note is the fact that even in the court filing, the state auditor noted that 50 plus counties have already given notice that they intend to use a different auditing for their county government and to not use the state auditor as state law now gives them that choice. The state auditor has uh, enjoined a court case against Wright County, Becker County, and Ramsey County and has been using the dollars from the state auditor's office to pay her legal fees from her office account. What we are doing also in this bill is requiring the state auditor to pay the legal costs of Wright County, Becker County, and Ramsey County. They are unwittingly three counties that are being stuck in the uh, situation of they've been selected out, three of the 87 counties, to bear the burden of paying their legal fees out of their county budgets. 
And so in this legislation, we require the state auditor to uh, compensate them out of her budget. As I mentioned before, uh, through Minute, uh, $14.6 million for cybersecurity. We also initiated a legislative commission on IT consolidation and a task force on cybersecurity. We recognize the emerging needs of cybersecurity by funding in this particular bill, but we also recognize that, that there it needs to be additional legislative oversight, and a task force and legislative commission will be very helpful. We did preserve public broadcasting. In addition, we added the Amber Alert additional. The ethnic minority councils, the advisory councils, their base funding was kept the same. We also have another task force on fiscal notes and the consideration of a legislative budget office in this bill. And the Office of Legislative Auditor gave a report a few years ago on fiscal notes and pointed up several issues. There were some changes made, but as we have gone through the last three months, fiscal notes continue to be an issue and definitely needs a legislative task force, including the governor's office and agencies as well, on this task force to take another look and make recommendations as to changing in the current fiscal note process or to go to a legislative budget office that would have other duties in addition to fiscal notes. Another area that uh, came to us, since I have the responsibility and jurisdiction of the rulemaking area, and increasingly Minnesotans have become aware of the additional regulations, the cost that that is adding to small businesses, to our farmers, to all areas of our walks and lives. Now we understand that some regulations are helpful and constructive, but especially in the area of affordable housing, uh, the construction industry has made us aware that oftentimes rules and regulations have been added such that it is making the price of an entry home becoming increasingly unaffordable, just through rules and regulations. I remember in our early married days when we had our first home and other families and other couples around us that were building their new homes, uh, we were caught in a unique situation. We built our home right at the cusp of being more energy efficient. It was very positive, very constructive, but it was our choice, not a mandate, and we executed several of them. However, then it became popular and the mandates came and the excessive tightness to homes, thus making it unhealthy. Children with asthma complaints were having issues. They were having mold, moisture, condensation. Then they mandated they had to have air exchangers, very expensive air exchangers, to deal with that problem. Eventually, they became to the common sense that homes need to have some breathing power. There needs to be some natural air exchange. But the goal of this particular piece of language says that if there is a piece, a rule, that would increase the costs of a home to $1,000 or more per unit, that you would have to come back to the legislature and have that reviewed. That is just common sense. One of the things to realize here is that we in the legislature have the duty of oversight. Now, if we give an agency some authority but something is going beyond what we might have intended, it is very appropriate for that rule to come back to that committee and for them to take another look, does this make sense or does it not? And have the opportunity to over, overrule the rule through the legislature. We will find that there are several areas in rules and regulations that regular Minnesotans out there over and over again have seen that these have gotten out of control and are excessive and beyond that which is helpful and beyond which we can absorb. So I'm very grateful for those changes that are in our bill. It is important to realize that in this particular budget, we do have some reductions to agencies. I would just like to mention that in, I have some experience in this area. This Senate body and the House and the governor decided, under Governor Pawlenty, decided that all agencies and all constitutional officers would take a 15% reduction from the previous year's budget. 
15 percent. Now, I have to tell you, as Secretary of State at the time, I wasn't real happy about that. And being a pretty frugal person, I'd worked hard to lead my office in very efficient work. And I was very concerned. But not only that, because I could not take anything out of elections due to a federal maintenance of effort requirement, I had to take 22 percent out of everything else. But my belief is also important to have leadership. So, uh, though I'm entitled to have an executive secretary, I decided to start with myself. And so I worked with a student worker to be my executive assistant and worked with the rest of my staff. Do you know what we discovered? We discovered that in my office, we were buying impact printers, impact printers, a very old, old, I don't know if you call it a technology. We were buying quadruplicate forms for those impact printers. We were hiring staff who separated those four components. Then they were distributed, and they were managed and handled and stored. Just by simply eliminating that one piece and using the technology of my office, we were able to save a large amount of that reduction to my office. Leadership matters, and I have a lot of confidence in these agencies that with a modest 7.5% or, as in the Department of Revenue, a 4 to 5% reduction, that with leadership they may also find things that they thought they couldn't do more efficiently and still maintain their services. I know I was able to do that, and I have confidence in their leadership that they will be able to do so as well. So, Mr. President, at this time, that is my presentation for Senate File 6 to 5 portion. I would like to request that we would recognize Senator Anderson for the Veterans and Military Affairs portion of Senate File 605. Further discussion, Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Appreciate the opportunity to present the Omnibus State Government Finance Bill. Uh, Senate File 1316 that was presented to the Veterans and Military Affairs Committee. First off, I'd like to thank those uh, individuals that were essential to our having a successful uh, committee. Uh, my CLA, Sheila Lures, and CA, Dave Reisenen, my researcher, Tim Bowl, uh, nonpartisan staff, Ms. Priya Primo, and Mr. Kevin Lundin. I also want to thank the members of my committee. Uh, Senators Lang, Hall, Housley, Senator uh, Goggin, Rood, Senator Sosinski, Senator Little, Senator Newton, the minority lead, Senator Schoen, and Senator Herr. Thank you for making the committee great. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, opportunity to do some uh, great uh, coming together on talking about essential items and so essential needs for veterans. Um, Senate file. 1316, I'm just going to try and pick apart basically um, the fiscal implications that this bill had. And this bill is the fiscal year 1819 omnibus finance proposal for the Departments of Military Affairs and Veterans Affairs. This bill meets the committee's target of $1 million over base, and the governor has requested $16,979,000 over base. The departments and line items are funded at base levels unless indicated in the following change items. And we'll start out with the Department of Military Affairs on your spreadsheet. If you would look at spread on spreadsheet, uh, page 15, lines 1960, 1990, and 2024, which are also in the bill, uh, page 20, lines 20.8 through 20.20. There's an increase of $6,920,000 uh, in enlistment incentives and corresponding to reductions of $6 million in maintenance, which was approximately 30%, and $920,000, approximately 15% uh, on general support. If we go down to uh, the next uh, line item, line 1976 on your spreadsheet on page 15, uh, you see a, uh, and, and you won't see any dollar amount because it was a transfer of $2 million uh, in fiscal year 2017 funds to enlistment incentives from the maintenance 
uh, line, uh, what was what had happened in, in the fiscal year 15-16 was that the department had requested there was an emergency need for uh, money to be transferred from the enlistment center funds because there was a big, a large increase. And so they had asked that money to be transferred from enlistment incentives to the uh, maintenance fund. And so now, because of the increase of military members coming back into uh, in joining, uh, there's a need for uh, increasing the money for <clears throat> enlistment incentives. And so we, based on our target of only a million dollars, we tried to return that money that we had uh, had been changed or uh, had been shifted uh, in the year 1516. Uh, we tried to move that money back into the enlistment incentives to provide for the veterans. Um, moving down into the, the other change items that we're talking about are the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, <clears throat> on page 16 of your spe spreadsheet, which is the next sh sheet over, um, line 2152. Uh, there is no direct uh, line item for this cemetery, but in 1516, the federal government came in and said that they would build, help build a cemetery in Duluth, Minnesota. And for that, we in turn said we would operate it and maintain it. And with that, we uh, took our million dollars that was our target uh, in, the <clears throat> in the general fund spending to support the operations of the newly constructed Duluth uh, State Veterans Cemetery. So you see in your bill that there's no direct line item for the cemetery, but there is a mention on line 2152 of the uh, spreadsheet. Next on page 16, uh, if you go down to uh, lines 2168, 2170, and 2172, which is uh, correlated in your bill, pages 22 and 23, lines 22.20 through 23.23. Uh, we had uh, three projects that were brought forth uh, by our committee and voted on, and they were laid off over for possible inclusion. They were, four, it was four, worth $400,000 in direct, expended, <clears throat> direct expenditures from the support our troops account and they are as follows, 175,000 was for Senator Chamberlain's Veterans Defense Project, uh, 175,000 for uh, Senator Bruce Anderson's Veteran Journey Home Project, and $50,000 uh, for Senator Paul Anderson's Veteran Voices Radio Program. <clears throat> um, the only uh, policy that we had in our bill was basically to give uh, some flexibility to the departments, both military affairs and veterans affairs. So if you go on page, in the bill, pages 40 through 41, the department had asked there for greater flexibility in supporting our troops dollars, and the bill adds that their requested f flexibility. Additionally, this bill authorizes the department to spend up to 500,000 more per year out of the support our troops account on enlistment incentives. And the same goes for uh, Veterans Affairs on pages of 41 and 42, lines 41.17 through lines 42.20. Uh, this proposal, again, will th give greater flexibility to the Department of Veteran Affairs. And uh, we also allow them to provide no cost or reduced cost burials to state veteran, in-state veterans cemeteries for veterans' dependents. And there was also a bill that came forward where we allow uh, the uh, Veterans Affairs to spend up to $3,000 per veteran on grants for disability access ramps in disabled veterans' personal homes. And that was uh, Senator Little's bill that uh, he had offered in, in committee. And so, members, if there are any other concerns or questions, I'd stand for questions. But I'll, uh, Mr. President, I'll turn it back over to the uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Any further discussion to Senate File 605? Senator Newton. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the uh, A36 amendment. 
Senator Newton offers the A36 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Newton moves to amend. Senate file number 605 as follows, page two, after line 33, insert. This is the A36 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the A36 amendment takes 8,330,000 out of the House's carry forward uh, and uses it to fund upgrades for our veterans' homes. Uh, as uh, Senator Anderson mentioned, there was only a $1 million increase in the budget in the uh, Department of, uh, or the MDVA's uh, budget, and that was for the uh, uh, Duluth uh, Cemetery. We have a lot of needs for our veterans' homes, and we have bills that have been moving forward, and people have been coming in from Bemidji and uh, Montevideo requesting uh, funding for homes uh, that will accommodate 72 uh, veterans uh, in the nursing homes in each of those communities. Um, in addition, we need additional work in our, our uh, current veterans' homes, the four existing uh, homes that provide nursing care. We need technology upgrades. Uh, we uh, have space now in Building 6 is where we move the veterans into the new Building 17. Uh, and that can be upgraded so that we can provide additional beds for, for veterans. And we're looking for CMS approval for uh, Medicare and Medicaid uh, so that uh, we can get that, especially in Laverne and Little Falls facilities. So uh, with that, Mr. President, I uh, think I've covered the essential points here. Also, with this funding, you know, we're looking for a bridge at, at the Minneapolis home. Uh, the current bridge has been taken down, and we're not certain whether we're going to have a bonding bill or not this year, but there's only one egress point uh, to get into the Minneapolis uh, facility, and we absolutely need that bridge, uh, and this uh, funding could be used for that as well. So uh, with that, Mr. Uh, President, I uh, would ask for the support of the body, and I'd like a roll call. Thank you. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Discussion to the amendment, Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Or Senator Newton, for offering the amendment. Uh, I can't disagree with anything you've said. I can't disagree with the dollar values you put out there. Uh, but at this point in time, I'm going to ask the council if this amendment is in balance. Mr. Chair, I've been advised that the amendment is in balance. So at this point, I'd like to offer an amendment to the amendment. Senator Lang moves an amendment to the amendment. Is it at the desk, Senator Lang? It is, is it? Mr. Chair. Uh, it's the A105 amendment. Secretary will report the amendment to the amendment. Senator Lang moves to amend the Newton Amendment to Senate File 605 as follows. Page 1, delete lines 2 through 7. This is the A105 Amendment. To the amendment, to the amendment, Senator Lang. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, all this amendment does is it removes the reduction from the House appropriation. Discussion to the amendment, to the amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of this amendment, A105, and would ask uh, a vote of support for this amendment to the amendment. What it does is it deletes the uh, appropriation area, which makes the uh, amendment, uh, original amendment, out of balance with the bill. And I'm asking for a yes vote. Thank you. Mr. President. Discussion to the A105. Senator Mr. Benson, President, for what purpose do you rise? Are we under call? Are we under call? Senator Benson, no, we are not. I would like to impose a call of the Senate. Senate is under call.
Senator Benson. Mr. President, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and that the Sergeant at Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. On and that. Mr. President, I'd like the roll call for the, uh, and my intention was the roll call for the duration of the bill, because I know that's the next question. Thank you, Senator Benson. To the motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The motion is adopted for the duration of the amendment. Mr. President. To the amendment. Senator Newman, for what purpose do you rise? Mr. President, uh, uh, I would uh, ask for a ruling of the, of the uh, President uh, that uh, by adopting the amendment to the amendment, uh, the bill is now out of balance. We need to adopt the amendment to the amendment. We haven't we adopted the we amendment. We need to adopt the amendment to the amendment. My apologies, Mr. President. I thought we had already voted on the amendment to the amendment. I'll, I'll hold up until we make that vote. We are on the A105 amendment. Further discussion, Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, although my amendment uh, was in balance, I believe that Senator Lang's uh, amendment to my amendment uh, puts it out of balance, and I would uh, have you ask you to uh, rule that uh, his amendment is not in order. Senator Newton, which rule are you challenging under? Mr. President, I am not certain what rule it is. Uh, it just seems to me that um, the amendment that Senator Lang offered uh, throws the bill out of balance. And uh, I, I just feel that that's, that shouldn't be done. Mr. President, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask if we could temporarily withdraw the amendment, and we're going to work on it a little bit. Yes. Senator Newton withdraws the A36 amendment. Is that correct? Senator Newton withdraws the A36 amendment. Further discussions to Senate File 605. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. Briefly, I would like to talk about this bill and a certain provision of it that I think is unfortunate. Um, I serve on the Finance Committee and I know that when this bill came forward, I had several questions for the author. Uh, first, on the basis that the bill cuts over $3 million from the Department of Administration during a time when we have roughly a $1.65 billion surplus. The second issue that was probably most important to me was the councils of color. And the councils of color are provided uh, for their, their base allotment in the bill. There's also provision that says that the councils of color must use the SMART system. And the current language of the SMART system says that the councils of color must use the SMART system and the Department of Administration may assess a fee to the councils of color. The reason for that provision in current law was because uh, there were some concerns by the auditor at one time about the, the councils of color and wanted to make sure that they were receiving all of the services that they needed to in order to be fiscally sound. In the current bill that is before us today, S Senator Kiffmeyer and the others seeks to now, with a, an amendment that was in, in finance, say that the Council of Color may use the Department of Administration's smart system. If they do, the Department of Administration must assess them, means charge them. Now, 
you would think that would be okay if there were finances and monies and resources provided to these councils of color to take advantage of this service. But there isn't. So when they are uh, uh, appropriate money at their base, now the, the assessment that they would have to pay for through the Department of Administration is roughly $42,000. So it equates to a 20% cut. And the reason why this was important to me and how I know this number is because I started doing some research and checking because one of the questions that I asked the author was what is the amount of money that now they would have to pay to receive these services that we believe to be important. And the only thing that the author said to me, well not the only thing, but one of the most important things that she said to me was that she believed that it, it was important for them to get this service and if they didn't want to get the service to SMART, wherever they get the service, they have to pay for it. Well, unfortunately, this bill does not provide for them the resources to do so, so it amounts to a 20% cut. So if, if um, uh, Mr. President, will, will Senator Kiffmeyer yield for a question? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Champion. Senator Kiffmeyer, if what I'm saying is true, which you can verify that, uh, that the cost for the services for the Council of Color, which is 11 small, or, 11 small organizations, would have to pay for the services that they get through the Department of Administration for the SMART system, and, it, and, and at $42,000 that they would have to pay each organization amounts to a 20% cut. Are you willing to relook at the language in your bill that would make it permissive for the Department of Administration to assess them or not? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator uh, Champion. And yes, I understand your question. And as always, as I've gone through every committee, I have been open uh, to options and considerations and would be glad to work with you in the future uh, for those kinds of considerations. But there was no dollar amount. And as I worked with the advisory councils quite a bit in the past, um, it was in the past that they did pay out of their appropriation for their own office services. And I appreciate the fact that SMART then was around and it is certainly an option for them to use that. But originally this was something that they did pay for out of their appropriation. But again, Senator Champion, I'm glad to discuss that with you and consider that as we go forward with this bill. Uh, or through conference committee. Senator Champion. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Kiff, uh, will, well, will S Senator Kiffmeyer yield for another question? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield, Senator Champion. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. When you were considering this bill and considering changes to the provision in the bill that would make it mandatory for of uh, the Councils of Color to pay for the service. Did you talk to the Councils of Color and, and or did they come into your committee to testify as to whether this provision should be changed and what would be the f fiscal uh, impact on their uh, organizations? Did, did you have an opportunity to have them to come in during this time to testify? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President and Senator Champion. I had many conversations with all of them in a variety of ways and a variety of issues as to the impact of their budget, their requests, and other things that they have. That is why uh, it was amended that instead of a must use, that it was an option for them. They could choose uh, to use either SMART or choose to meet the needs of their advisory council in some other way. And so it was not mandated that they use SMART or not done so. Senator Champion. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Senator Kiffmeyer, although I don't feel as if you answered my question, thank you for trying. Maybe I wasn't articulate enough in order to, to specifically ask a question that you would uh, answer. But the reason why I'm saying that, Senator Kiffmeyer, is, is I trust that you've had some conversations with the Council of Color um, because you have at one time served uh, that, that council, and I know at one time that you were heading up the uh, commission to consider sunsetting of those uh, councils. But my, my specific question was during the time that you were considering and putting this bill together to ask them specifically what the dollar cost would be. 
One of, one of the reasons why I believe this to be important that uh, perhaps that wasn't done is because the councils of color would tell you that they were going to take a 20% hit. If now, this current law would be changed so that they had to pay for the service before the Department of Administration could decide if they were going to assess them or not. And I also asked you, Senator Kiffmeyer uh, and, and Mr. President, uh, during the finance, whether the Department of Administration complained and thought that the current law was something that wasn't uh, workable. And it's my understanding that there, was, uh, th there wasn't a complaint from the, de from the Department of Administration, that this was something that uh, 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 the author just decided to do. With that being said, uh, Mr. President, I would hope that uh, Senator Kiffmeyer would consider uh, 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 changing this language so that it would go back to current law and that these services can be, be provided to the councils of color without any additional expense and or if there's going to be the requirement for them to uh, pay for this service, then there should be resources that follows it so that they don't take a 20% cut. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And so I just want to just clarify here that uh, these particular advisory councils, um, the uh, one receives 802,000 biannually, another 772,000, another one 728, and the fourth one 1,152,000. And um, I, if I recall, you made a mention of a number, but that certainly, to my uh, management anyway, doesn't seem to add up to that kind of percent. Do want to mention that in the past, a uh, couple of these minority councils were uh, audited by the offices of the legislative auditor. They received several very serious findings, and it was at that time uh, that the requirement was placed upon them in an effort to work with them. Uh, because I chaired the Sunset Commission, it was my duty, legislatively established in statute, to review many councils and many, many boards for consideration in regards to the law requiring us to do so. And they were not sunset. Uh, there were some uh, statutory changes made to help structure them in such a way, and I invested a great deal of personal time with them and legislative time to uh, give them assistance. And it's been great to see of late that they have made many substantial improvements and changes and constructive changes uh, in regards to that. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that record. Thank you. And yes, I will continue to work with you for uh, consideration um, after. Senator Cohen. Thank you, Mr. President. Ms. President, uh, and members, let me just talk about uh, one aspect of this bill. I'm going to follow up from Senator Champion's comments. Um, I don't serve on, on Senator Kiffmeyer's uh, committee, but uh, when I was first a finance chair, uh, I did have jurisdiction over many of the agencies uh, in the budget. And I want to speak in, in particular about one agency, and that's uh, the Department of Administration. Uh, it tends to be an often ignored and misunderstood uh, agency within state government. Uh, but it's one that's central to the operation of, of state government in a very efficient way. Senator Champion talked about the SMART program and how it's uh, related to uh, the, the proper function of uh, the councils of color. But it goes a little bit beyond that. Um, members should understand that the SMART program, which is eliminated in this bill, is something that was established as an effort to promote efficiency in state government. We all talk about the need to promote efficiencies in, in government, to try to save money, to make sure that the services delivered are delivered in a proper and efficient and cost-conscious way. This is the essence of that desire. What the SMART program does is to provide services to these small agencies, not just simply the councils of color, but a variety of the small agency and boards that if they had to deal with the human resource concerns, the other kinds of, of agency concerns that with a larger agency can have staff capacity to, to do the kind of functions that are needed, um, those smaller agencies are not quite up to it. They'd have to hire a variety of individuals to do something uh, where the time required is not quite the same as a large agency. That's what the SMART program does. That's what we eliminate. There are other aspects in this bill that I think go counter to what we want to see. There's the elimination of the Office of Grants Management. 
Um, and uh, I, I think in, in the Finance Committee, I asked uh, Senator Kiffmeyer about that and suggested that that function could be folded within the agency as it, as it now stands. I am a, a huge fan of the utilization of, of nonprofits. Uh, I think we get something uh, in terms of efficiency. We get something in terms of the multiplicity of, of, uh, of the kinds of functions that a, a nonprofit brings, as opposed to something being placed right directly within an agency. Um, I think it's the intersection of liberal and conservative thought in government. But with all the nonprofits that are utilizing uh, grants from the state, to have an oversight agency to make sure it's done properly, to make sure the agency is the nonprofit agency is operating in a way that uh, comports with what we want to see, this very small appropriation does that. Um, I think Senator Lori might, might also talk about uh, uh, what happens with the elimination of, of the Olmstead plan money in, in uh, admin. Uh, so I won't, I won't speak to that. Uh, just another example, though, I've talked about SMART. I would also talk about uh, uh, what's called the Continuous Improvement uh, Office uh, that used to be known as LEAN. And this is something that promotes a variety of efficiencies uh, in state government in terms of return on investment, in terms of uh, uh, how we use data to determine uh, decisions. This was actually a reform instituted by Governor Pawlenty when he was governor. It's something that I believe has received national recognition and it's something that uh, Governor Pawlenty was quite proud of in terms of bringing, again, efficiency into state government. That's eliminated uh, in this bill. Um, I'll just raise one other issue. I mean, there are a variety of issues. Something that doesn't quite fit in the same way, but something that's a, that's a disappointing uh, elimination and, and uh, deduction for the agency is uh, the assistance for the census in, in 2020. Uh, Minnesota faces a potential crisis with the next census. We are in all likelihood going to lose a congressional seat. We're going to see some considerable shifting in terms of, of how our population intersects with the national population. And I don't have to uh, talk to people on the floor about what uh, the census does in terms of the impact on the state, both within and without. So to eliminate the money to provide the technical assistance to the census is something that will have some long-reaching effects on Minnesota for a number of years, certainly until the 2030 census. So I can go through the bill relative to the Department of Administration, some of the things it does. What it does do is it takes away the efficiencies, the, you know, we talk about operating a government like a business. Th these are exactly the things the Department of Administration does. I'll just offer one last thought, uh, Mr. President and members. Everybody has raved on and on about the renovation of the state capitol and how it looks, what, what has been done. Uh, there's nobody in the state that disagrees with what's happened in the Capitol. It was the Department of Administration that did that. It was the, uh, the Director of Repair and Maintenance for the state that was the project manager for the state out of admin. Absent admin, there would have been no renovation of the Capitol and certainly no renovation at the level that, uh, that we now see. Those are the kinds of things that we are taking away in this bill and I hope members will think about that when we talk about an efficient state government. Further discussion to Senate File 605, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam, M Mr. President, sorry. And so I just wanted to address, to clarify, because for members, you hear the word smart, and you're like, what is that? So small resource, it's uh, for small agencies, it's a resource. Uh, but I'd just like to read to you from the current statute that shows you the intention that has been in law. Number one, if the commissioner provides administrative support services to a small agency, the commissioner must enter into a service level agreement with the agency, specifying the services to be provided and the costs and anticipated outcomes of the services. Now this is uh, obviously here in statute, the intention is that this smart uh, entity within admin would pay for itself. In other words, those who use the services would pay for those services and that there would be a service level agreement. And so that was the original intent of the legislation. I think it's very positive. I was very puzzled when I heard uh, the Department of Administration testify that they had a waiting list. I thought there should be no waiting list. They would be paying for the services that they received. 
there's value there, but pay for those services. So I just wanted to clarify that this is what is in current statute, and I think it is a very sound policy. This is a valuable service that can be provided by the Department of Administration, but paying for those services is a significant benefit to smaller agencies as well. And I think that is a, a very good uh, way to work this out, and that those services rendered then are paid for, and it is uh, completed within that regard, and you would not need to have any such waiting list. Thank you. Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. I have the 845 amendment at the desk. Senator Marty moves the A45 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Marty moves to amend Senate file 605 as follows, page 25, delete section one. This is the A45 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Marty. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is an amendment to pull the policy provisions out of the budget bill. I think there's a lot of uh, many controversial budget items in here. We don't need to add in controversial or uncontroversial even policy things. Uh, eyelash technician regulation may be a really good thing to do, but we don't need to have rulemaking for that in a budget bill. I urge your support for pulling out these provisions. They can very well travel in separate bills. I know when there only are appropriations bills for people to put things into, that's the tendency to do. But I think we should learn from that practice and we should um, do what I think the governor and a lot of us have said we want to do, and so I urge you to support this and ask for roll call. Roll call being requested, roll call granted. Discussion to the amendment, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President, and uh, respectfully, while I appreciate Senator Marty has offered quite a few of these amendments, uh, the, these sections of the bill are very important uh, to the complete language of the bill, to the funding, and uh, their relationships between the languages that sections that he's referring to. So members, I would urge a no vote on the A45 amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the A45 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 29 ayes and 38 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion to the bill, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, uh, do really bother me in this bill that I need to cover. Uh, and I'll, I'll start out with, with uh, a couple of small ones. Firstly, there's, uh, uh, we did have the commissioners all testify pretty strongly against the cuts that are being made in their agencies. And uh, they have all written letters, and those letters, copies of those letters are on your desks. And I'd like to draw your attention to the Department of, of Revenue, where the uh, Department of Revenue said that there's a cut of $32 million less in funding than is needed to maintain their present services. And it says that there's the loss of about 121 employees 
who work each day to serve Minnesotans. These are the people that answer the phones, these are the people that uh, respond to your tax inquiries and also do your taxes. And they do the, uh, the investigations and the follow-ups and the collections. And if you look uh, at uh, page two, it says that there's an estimate that these people turn over a three to one margin. So if we do a cut, we're gonna reduce the revenue at least $38 million. And the $38 million is not accommodated in this bill. So I think there's, a, there's an imbalance by keeping this into the bill. Now, let me go to another one so you can think about this. In uh, Section 51, Section 51 is a repealer. And that repealer is part of the, the part that uh, repeals the campaign finance public subsidy. Unfortunately, it grabs too many words in that repealer, and it repeals the PCR as well. And it also repeals the, uh, um, some of the contribution levels that can be given to people and also your spending level. So all of us would be released from our spending levels. But the big thing is the PCR, which a lot of uh, new candidates use to get funds so that they can uh, have the opportunity to run for office. And for repealing that, I think is uh, something that, and I'm not sure if uh, Senator Kiffmeyer actually meant that because we did get conflicting views on it, but from the Campaign Finance Board, they did confirm that this would uh, end the PCR uh, program, and then we actually did uh, get our Senate counsel for the committee to agree also. So that's, that's a couple of things that I think are very important that we take another look at, and I think uh, there are many other things that are problems in this bill, but I think those are two of them that, for me, would constitute a no vote. So I appreciate your, the time, and I urge everyone to vote no. Senator Lorry. All right. Uh, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, I uh, have the A, I have two amendments. I have the first one is the A51 amendment. Senator Hoffman moves the A51 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend Senate File 605 as follows, page 55, after line 12, insert. This is the A51 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and members. You know, there was a, a gentleman two years ago who approached uh, then uh, State Representative Abler and myself and and uh, Representative uh, Uglum, and I was told, Mr. President, that I can, I don't have to say the other body anymore uh, uh, from our current uh, president, but I, I, that was supposed to be funny, so forget it. The, um, the point I'm trying to make is there was a Civics Lesson 101 in this uh, young man from Champlin and his, uh, and his wantingness to be able to have an individual who has not reached 18 years of age, but he's eligible requirements for voting by the time he turns 18, which should allow him to vote or cast a primary election or a presidential nomination primary just for the purpose of nominating candidates to be voted on the subsequent general election. Uh, and, and that's it. And, and it was uh, something that he dreamed up of in, in high school in a, in, a, in a civics class and wanted it to take it in I just would hope in the last two years that we have gotten some kind of action in this, and I and I um, am still been waiting. We've re requested uh, to have uh, hearings on it, and we just haven't gotten anywhere. And, and what's the hard lesson for me, Mr. President and members, is that this is a youth who really wanted to participate in the process, and and as a matter of fact, it got so much attention that the Associated Press is now doing a story on this youth and other youths that want to be able to exercise that right. So with that, I would hope that members would uh, please allow this. It's a simple policy change. It's not any money uh, lifted on it. And I would hope that members would uh, sure support it and give me a yes for this. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, certainly, I recognize Senator Hoffman. We all. Uh, with our children and grandchildren. We certainly work hard to get them to be engaged, but the Minnesota Constitution requires that you be 18 years old on election day when you vote. 
this particular language in this bill would not comply with the Minnesota Constitution. Members, I just urge a no vote to the A51 amendment. Further discussion to the amendment, Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Madam Chair, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer, for reminding us that we have to be 18. That's correct. We do have it in here. We're not changing the age to vote in the general election. All Jack Joa wanted to do within the the area was to be able to, knowing that a child is going to be 18 for the general election, allow that person to cast a primary vote and to be part of the process. Uh, within their local entity, and that's all we're asking here, a real simple civics uh, 101 lesson, and I would hope that people would sure vote for this. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The Minnesota Constitution uh, does not designate general election or primary or local or county or city or anything like that. It simply says you have to be 18 years old of age to vote. Members, again, I urge you a no vote to this amendment does not comply with the Minnesota Constitution. Senator Hoffman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Members, I would request a roll call. Roll call is requested. Roll call granted. Senator Limmer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, last time I, I read anything about this issue, the Constitution would trump a state law like this. Not as in the term President Trump, but it would trump it. And you have to be aware of that, Senator Hoffman. <laughs> Further discussion to the A51 amendment. Senator Swadzinski. Uh, just um, for what it's worth, if you are going to be 18 on election day, we already allow you to participate in precinct caucuses. So it stands to reason that we would allow those young people that have this sense of civic and virtue and political efficacy, the um, wherewith it to uh, participate in the primary, which limits, which allows them to make the next logical step to vote in the um, general election. So I support um, Mr. Senator Hoffman's amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. And so thank you, Senator Kwadzinski. Um, but in regards to a precinct caucus, a political party is a private association. It is a private organization. It is not a type of election where you have a public election such as the general election or the state primary or the school district or county, city, or township election. So a precinct caucus is a private association. They can make those rules in accordance with their desires. Thank you. Further discussion to the A51 amendment. Senator Abler. Thank you, Senator Hoffman, for bringing this amendment forward and highlighting one of, uh, one of uh, Champlin's greatest youths. And uh, one thing I know he's very proud of is his country and, and the, the founding of it and, and the way we were a, a rule of law and, and, and how we govern ourselves. And I'm a co-author on this bill, I believe, and, and I was all eager to go ahead as much as you were and then discover this constitutional issue. And, and so I'd hate to trash his... Uh, his interest and excitement about this country by violating the Constitution in a way to help him out to vote a little early. And so uh, while it pains me to not vote uh, for this, I'm, I'm voting uh, with, in regard to the Constitution for one of America's finest. So I wish him the best, and I hope he's watching. Thanks. Further discussion to the A51 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment.
All senators having voted a desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 31 ayes and 36 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. I want to yield to Senator Cohen. Mr. President, I am so sorry. It, it must be late, Mr. President. Guess I can't yield. Um, I, I, I think I ran out of the loop. I think Senator Cohen should go before me. Further discussions? Do you want to? Senator Newton. Thank you, Mr. President. I think we have this straightened out now on the, uh, the transfer of funds. I'd like to offer the A107 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Newton moves to amend Senate file number 605 as follows. Page 2, after line 33, insert. This is the A107 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I would like to offer the uh, A108 as an amendment to the amendment. And what this does is that we, we now find Senator the Newton, the Secretary will report the amendment to the okay. amendment. Senator Newton moves to amend the Newton Amendment to Senate file number 605 as follows, page 1 after line 7. This is the A108 amendment to, to the, the amendment. amendment. To the amendment, Senator okay. Newton. Thank you, Mr. President. This clarifies uh, what we were uh, working with uh, before and uh, I think will help Senator Lang as well. It gives us both the revenue and then the expenditure to provide funding for upgrades to uh, the existing uh, veterans' homes and to have the reserve set aside for uh, the homes in uh, Monticello and uh, Bemidji. Thank you, Mr. President. Discussion to the A108 amendment to the amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just a little bit, I have been given the a 108 amendment, and yet on the Senate uh, amendments, it says 107. So I'm uncertain as to what we have here. Could you just please clarify before we proceed? Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, the A107 amendment was offered, and then the A108 amendment was offered as an amendment to the A107. We are currently on the A108 amendment to the amendment. Thank you. Further discussion to the A108 amendment to the amendment. Senator Pratt. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. If, uh, would Senator Newton yield for a question? Senator Newton will yield. Senator Pratt. So, S Senator Newton, your amendment to the amendment is still transferring uh, $8.3 million from, to the general fund from the House of Representatives carry forward account? Senator Newton. Thank you, Senator Pratt. We're transferring the funds uh, on uh, line 20, I think it is, or on uh, page 20. Uh, to uh, appropriations for the Department of Military, or to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Transferring funds from line 20. So, Senator Newton. Senator Pratt. Uh, our, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Newton would yield. So, Senator Newton, I'm sorry, Senator I'm having Newton a hard time. Senator Newton will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Uh, so, what are the source of funds on page 20? I'm still trying to get to that section of the bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam President and uh, Senator Pratt. Senator the, Newton. The source of funds is the uh, House Carry Forward funds. Madam President. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam President. I would. Uh, uh, request that this uh, amendment be ruled out of order uh, per Rule 7.4, Section 3, change in appropriations transfers of revenues to an agency that was not in the bill as it was reported to the floor of the Senate. I don't recall seeing an appropriation from the House of Representatives carry forward account anywhere else in this bill. And Senator Pratt, your objection is made directly to the A108. 
the amendment to the amendment. Well, Madam President, the A108 uh, still carries the carry forward from the A107, so they're in part uh, tied together, and that was the question I just asked Senator Newton. Senator Newton. Madam President, the, the funds are, uh, that we're taking are on line 228 of the bill. Madam President, advice. Senator Latt's advice. Uh, Madam President, the House budget is in this bill. So it seems to me this is properly tied in. Further advice? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, if Senator Latz would yield for a question. Senator Latz will yield. Senator Pratt. Thank you. Senator Latz, can you show me where uh, specifically the House carry forward account is referenced in the in the uh, Senate File 605 bill. Madam President, this is coming from line 2.28 in the bill. Senator Newton. Senator Newton, you need to wait to be recognized. We are waiting on Senator Latz to respond. Thank so you, just Madam President. <laughs> I get pretty anxious there. <laughs> Senator Latz. Madam President. Senator Latz. Uh, line 11 on the spreadsheet uh, shows the uh, budget allocations. Um, the uh, carry forward is actually itemized there, but there's no numbers that shows for it because um, it just automatically carries forward. Uh, but there is a line, line 11, on the spreadsheet for this bill that, dis that uh, references the legislative carry forward. And clearly it's authorized to be carried forward because that's there. Senator Nelson, advice. Uh, well, Madam President, I don't see that spreadsheet, but if there's no numbers on that, how do we know how much is in that House Carry Forward account? So uh, if I can see those numbers, um, I don't see the numbers. So uh, it's hard to tell if an amendment is in, is, um, if it's uh, fiscally balanced if we don't know what the fund is in that House Carry Forward account. I do not see any numbers on that spreadsheet. Madam President. Advice, Senator Cohen. Uh, if I m might, uh, Madam President. M Madam President, um, I, I think as, as uh, mentioned by uh, Senator Latz, if you look at uh, line 11 on the spreadsheet, and obviously the spreadsheet's in front of us, it references the legislative carry forward. Now, the way this budget has always been handled is the carry forward is never specified as an amount, but because it's carry forward. And uh, the way the spreadsheet has op has been set up for, as best I know, years and years, the amount of the carry forward is contained within that uh, particular line, line 11. 
So it's clearly in front of us, simply because it doesn't have the amount specified. Uh, we have used this amount in the past. We've used it for amendments on the floor. We've used it for other purposes on the floor uh, to pre prevent our being allowed, or Senator Newton to be allowed uh, the opportunity to amend as he would like to is something that is absolutely against uh, all process and procedure that we've utilized in finance bills on the floor over the years. Um, I can't remember, Madam President, when we've ever not allowed a discussion of the legislative carry forward. Thank you. Senator Pratt, we need a clarification on the point of order that you are making. That is part of our, our discussion. Are, are you challenging the, and some of the discussion and the arguments that were made are, appear to me to be closer to the A107, and so I'm trying to figure out exactly what your point of order is. Is it regarding the A108, and you're making it under 7.4? Thank you, Madam President. I'm probably making, I guess I'm making the, the uh, point of order under uh, Amendment 107 with the, with the understanding that the A108 is tied to the A107. So if, if it's appropriate to withdraw the, the point of order for the A108, I can renew it for the A107. Well, the A108 is what we have in front of us, Senator Pratt. So Thank that you. is where your point of order is directed, and you are making the, you are making the case that, and I believe you said it was seven four, section four. Yes. That, and it would create or increase the amount of tax revenue by reducing appropriations and transfers. That is that was, and I'm just trying to clarify exactly because we were I was seven seven point four item three. Item three. So, Madam President, advice. Senator Latz. Under 7.4, uh, paragraph 3, uh, the agency is clearly in the bill. Uh, so, paragraph 3 only applies to changes to an agency that was not in the bill. Senator Pratt. I'm going to rule Senator Pratt's point well taken that um, the vets' homes would not be cont or are contained in the agency and this, no, I'm sorry. The point is well taken. And the A108 is ruled out of order. Sorry. I'm sorry, did I say two different things? Is well taken. Madam President, may I offer some last minute advice before you make a final yes, decision? Yes, please, please do. I'm sorry, I was trying to, I came up in the middle and I apologize for being a bit confused because I'm trying to make, trying to read the bill at the same time. So please, a little more advice. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, I think the point of 7.4 paragraph 3 is so that we can't take money, for example, from the environment bill and transfer it into this bill and try to make it work that way. The point is if you're going to use money, it's got to be money involving an agency that's already dealt with within the appropriation bill that's before the body. And clearly that's the case here because the legislature, the House in this particular case, their budget is within this bill. So it's perfectly acceptable to move money around within or between uh, the line items 
within this particular appropriations bill, the point of paragraph three is that you can't pull from someone else's appropriations bill or some other appropriation bill, an agency that's not before the body at this moment. Madam President. Senator Pratt. And Thank I you, Madam President. I withdraw my point of order. Thank you. Yeah. Madam President. And we do have the A108 in front of us, and we're I would Senator like a Newton. roll call, uh, Madam President. There's a roll call on the A108 has been requested. Roll call granted. Senator Nelson. Did you have your hand? Madam President, my, I have a question uh, which has to do with how many times, how do we know there is adequate funds in this unnamed source? We don't know how much is in the legislative carry forward fund. So technically we could spend all night uh, adopting amendments that take money from the legislative carry forward fund. I don't see anything on this spreadsheet that tells me if there's $5 in there or $500 billion in there. We don't know. Now, if somebody can produce a document that tells me how much is in this legislative carry forward fund, then we could make a real decision about this amendment. But to this point, it could be zero. It could be a dollar. We don't know how much is in this uh, carry forward fund. So I find that it would be um, out of order for us to be taking a certain amount of money from a legislative carry forward fund that we don't know how much is in there. Senator Miller. Uh, Madam President, I would like to uh, stand a uh, point of order. For point of order. State your point of order, Senator Miller. Madam President and members, I would rule under Section 402 of Mason's Paragraph 5 uh, that the amendment to the amendment is not germane. An amendment to an amendment must be germane to the subject of the amendments as well as to the main question. And we're dealing with an amendment that deals with taking funds uh, from an account, and then we're also dealing with another amendment that is a completely different subject uh, on veterans' homes. The subjects are completely different. Um, therefore, the amendment to the amendment is not germane to the subject of the amendment as well as the main question. Madam President, advice? Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, this is the state government budget bill. I mean, I, I can't imagine any, anything more germane. You're dealing with state government budgets. Uh, boy, if we go down this rabbit hole, uh, you know, we will uh, be having this kind of objection to probably every amendment uh, for the next several years um, to every appropriations bill, uh, unless you're planning to take the money right out of the same pocket and put it right back into the same pocket. Uh, you know. These omnibus bills have lots of pockets in them. And just about every amendment that you've seen in the last four years, and probably for the next four years, we be taking from one pocket in the same pair of pants and putting them in a different pocket in the same pair of pants. Uh, members, this is all the same pair of pants. Further advice? Senator Utke. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, too, am looking here on line 11, where it says legislative carry forward. Go to the next column, fund name. There is none. This is, this is a credit card with no money in it or a checkbook with no money. We have no idea where it's coming from. Further advice, Senator Pappas. Thank you. Turn it on. Um, Madam Chair, I think the argument is about the germaneness of the amendment to the amendment, not about whether there's adequate funding in the account. If people don't feel there's adequate funding in the bill, 
then they should vote against the amendment. Further advice? Madam Chair. Senator Ralph. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, further advice. It seems to me that the, that the argument here is, first of all, where the money is coming from and how much there is. And I think this ignores the fact that we have a budget, and we have a budget number of 802 million and some change. And the object of Rule 7.4 is to stay within that number, that we're not supposed to bring money in from the outside. Therefore, an amendment that attempts to bring money in from the outside of the budget would not be germane to the particular topic at hand. Thank you. Madam President, Madam President, I just, I just want to make sure, as a point of information, uh, I've got the number for the uh, House carry forward, but that's not what's in front of us right now. Senator Miller's, because I think members are confused as to what's yes, in front of us. And, and Senator Cohen, I do understand that. And I, know, I think there was a little bit of a kind of residual arguments that folks wanted to make, given the, when we were on the original, or on the A. 108. But in order to um, move things along, I am going to put the question to the body. And um, under 35.4, whether an amendment is germane is to, be, is to be decided by the president who may put the question to the body if the president chooses. So the secretary will take the role on whether or not the, um, the amendment is germane. So it would be the A108 would be germane to under, under Mason's, yes. So a yes vote is germane, and a no vote is not germane. Madam President, Madam President. Madam President. S Senator Lori. <clears throat> Madam President, I don't think there's a germaneness question. There's a, whether it's out of order is rule 7.4, germaneness No, uh, is Senator 35. Miller's germaneness question from Mason's was a germaneness question. Was a germaneness question. I think maybe you it, really ought to clarify exactly what it is. There is a great deal of confusion under, about what the challenge is. There was a long conversation about rule 7.4. Maybe we should be entirely clear. He questioned helpful. the germaneness of the amendment under section 204, uh, oh, excuse me, 402, section 402, subdivision 5 of Mason's. It appears on page 273. Is, am I, it, Senator Miller, am I correct? Yes, he's nodding his head. That is what he challenged. Madam President. It's, yes, Senator Ress. <clears throat> Although I think it's um, perfectly proper for you to put the question to the body, I don't think you, from your position, can declare that it has to be a roll call. It has to be requested, and so I request a roll call. Thank you, Senator Rest. So I will again, the, uh, Senator Chan. To this question, Senator Kipmeyer. Yes, Madam President, I just want to be have it be clear the, what a yes vote or a no vote means in this particular situation. If we just be real clear on that, thank you. A yes vote would mean germane, and there has been a roll call requested, and a no vote would mean not germane, Senator Champion. Madam President, sorry for 
being so indecisive, but I want to make sure that we can move forward. But I want the body to be very clear uh, what, is, what it means to be germane. And if you look at section 402, and if you look at uh, 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 number three, it says to be germane, the amendment is required only to relate to the same subject. So I've heard a number of different people saying things about um, the amount of money, all these other things. Germaneness is only whether it's the same subject, and that's the narrow question that is before the body. I think, I think we understand what we're going to be voting on. Yes, would may, it would rule the amendment germane. No, we'll rule it not germane. The secretary will take the roll. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not germane. We will move back to the A107. And, and discussion on the A107, Senator uh, Newton. Madam President, I'd like to withdraw the amendment. Senator Newton has withdrawn the A107. Further discussion on Senate File 605. Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to offer the A75 amendment. Senator Kent has offered the A75 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Kent moves to amend House, uh, Senate File 605 as follows. Page 49 after line 8, insert. This is the A75 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam President. The A75 amendment addresses two aspects of state labor agreements. It would ratify the collective bargaining agreement with the Minnesota Government Inter Engineering Council, and it would ratify the amendments to the state's labor contracts and compensation plans providing paid parental leave. Uh, this contract covers approximately, um, so the first section uh, of the amendment, section 42, covers uh, the contract, uh, approximately 990 engineers, 15 job classes, and 13 state agencies, most of whom are at the Department of Transportation. Forgive me, I was not quite ready. I'm missing a piece of paper. This was the final remaining collective bargaining agreement from the 2015 to 17 agreements approved by the 2016 legislature. Several issues were certified to come before the arbitrator. Uh, the across the board increases for both years one and two of the contract were equivalent to the other bargaining unit agreements approved by the 2016 legislature at two and a half percent. In three of the five submitted job classes, the arbitrator awarded MGEC their requested 3.5% uh, increase for only the final step of their pay scale. The second part of the amendment are uh, the second and third sections, sections 43 and 44, and these pertain to the approval of the memorandums of understanding granting paid parental leave to state employees. Um, as a matter of background for this, uh, please be aware that Minnesota allowed state workers who had a baby or adopted a child after July 1st of 2016 to take six weeks paid parental leave. The purpose of this amendment would be to formally ratify those MOUs and extend this benefit to state employees moving forward. Members, there are highly valuable profession, professionals in our workforce right now 
who are expecting, to, um, who are currently pregnant and relying on this benefit to take care of their families in the coming weeks and months. MNB negotiated these amendments with the state's bargaining units to provide this leave policy as part of its contract, which led to a letter from the governor's office creating a group to study the issue. Governor Dayton later accepted the group's recommendation of six weeks paid parental leave for state employees following the birth or adoption of a child. So it's important to understand why paid parental leave it makes sense for the state as an employer. It makes Minnesota a, work -friendly, a family friendly workplace. And as a major employer in Minnesota, it is important for us to join our private sector counterparts. Minnesota is a great place for workers and families, and this policy will help the state agencies attract more, more people to the workforce. We hear repeatedly about worker shortages, and we need to be able to recruit, and this will help us. And in addition, we hear about turnover and competitive opportunities and other jobs, and we need to be able to retain these talents because turnover is expensive. Many Minnesota private companies offer paid parental leave because they know it is good for their employees. They also know that it is good for their bottom lines. And high, um, high visibility examples include Target, 3M, General Mills, Mayo Clinic, US Bank, Ecolab, and Summit Brewing. Also, another, a number of other local government entities offer this benefit, including the cities of St. Paul, Brooklyn Park, St. Louis Park, Richfield, Hennepin County, and the University of Minnesota. The next generation of workers is going to have more opportunities. We are facing um, a worker shortage. This is a job seekers market, and this is a benefit that will attract younger workers who want to be in a family-friendly workplace. And in a particularly startling statistic here in Minnesota, women of childbearing age between the ages of 18 and 44 are leaving state government at a rate of 10%, more than double the average turnover rate. And finally, it's important to realize that paid parental leave obviously is good for the people of Minnesota. Parents, children, families. Research overwhelmingly shows that paid parental leave builds strong families along with a more productive workforce. The Minnesota Department of Health has a white paper called Paid Leave and Health on the Benefits of, of Paid Parental Leave to Children, Parents, and Employers. And it finds that employees with access to such policies are healthier, they use less sick time, they spend less money on health care, which is of great concern to all of us, and their children, notably, do better in school. And as we all know, the first few weeks of a baby's life are a critical time for their development and an important bonding time for families. And it's worth noting that most licensed child care providers will not accept infants younger than six weeks of age. So to wrap up and why I believe this is so important and members why I think we need to support this and take care of our workforce, Minnesotans strongly support paid family leave. A 2015 survey shows that 76% of Minnesotans support paid leave time for the birth or adoption of a child, and that is a, that is a figure that crosses party lines. And finally, I want to quote the governor of Arkansas because Arkansas became the fifth other state in the United States that offers this benefit. When Asa Hutchinson signed his state's paid parental leave uh, for state worker in February, he summed it up well. He says this gives more options to parents, it gives them a better balance with the workplace, and it gives us, as a state, a better chance of retaining those high quality workers that we need to make state government run well. This is the state government bill. It is all about making state government run well, and I can't think of a more important message than that we are supporting the important professionals that do the important work for the state of Minnesota. Members, I would ask you to please support these Minnesotans who work hard for our state. Thank you. To the A75 Amendment, Senator Coran. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to speak on uh, uh, on the amendment uh, A75, I think what we need to be aware of and, and that it's important that we retain and, and provide great benefits and services to our state employees. They're precious to us in, in the job they do. Um, being a former member of the, both AFSCME, MMA, and, and MAPE, and a, a former employee for almost 18 years, I think what people kind of forget in the uh, public sector arena is that we already have benefits that are greatly in excess of the private sector. And when you look at the ability to plan for those significant life events, much like the birth of a child or the adopt adoption of a child, you can plan in state government jobs or, or public sector positions far better than you can in the private sector. 
you have the ability to carry over significant amounts of vacation leave. Um, if you're a, a new employee, you typically start out with almost three and a half weeks of vacation. You can carry that over um, to hundreds of hours and, and accumulate to plan for those, those life events. You also have the ability to plan for and carry over. I think the basic employee begins with three and a half weeks of sick leave, which you can carry over in excess of 1,000 hours before those, those uh, hours are reduced. Those are benefits that are not available to the private sector. They're important, um, and, and the private sector has moved in many different ways, but those things are not available in the private sector. And so I would ask that um, we do not uh, accept in, in this amendment um, for the purposes of it's great, in great, great excess of what's available in the private sector. The accumulation of those benefits is significant. Yet most people in the private sector can't carry more than two weeks of leave combined sick or annual. Um, in this case, you can accumulate hundreds and hundreds of hours of leave to plan for those significant events. So I would ask that, that uh, this amendment be voted down. Thank you. Senator Benson. Um, Madam President, a point of inquiry. State your point. Um, Senator Kent, is it your intent to uh, impact the higher ed budget with this amendment? Will Senator Kent yield? Senator Kent will yield. Madam President, I was referencing that the University of Minnesota already provides this benefit. Um, so, no, at this point, these are all, uh, these are all, right now, all of these uh, ratifications, the contracts that are being ratified, the provisions that are being ratified according to the A75 amendment are covered by agency budgets. This, these are already happening, and we are just ratifying them so that they can continue. Uh, it is a relatively small cost across a great number of agencies and workers, and so these are, there is no fiscal impact directly to this bill in terms of a fiscal note. It is absorbed into the agencies because it's already in their budgets. Um, Senator Benson. Madam President, I believe we're talking about the next biennium, the budgets that haven't been ratified yet. I'm referring specifically to subdivisions 10 and 11. If Senator Kent could please clarify for me, do subdivisions 10 and 11 impact budgets outside the purview of the budget we're currently discussing? Senator Kent. Madam President, again, in, in working with council and in researching this, we have been informed that there is no fiscal note to this provision. It is already in the, in the amounts it, that are being managed. It's relatively minor, and so there is no fiscal impact. So, Senator Benson. Um, Madam President, I have a memo from when the Subcommittee on Employee Relations was supposed to meet to discuss this issue that indicates there'd be about a $2 million impact to Minnesota State, uh, about a $6 million impact to the state of Minnesota. So I'm wondering why we're getting contradictory information. And I'm wondering if, uh, if Senator Kent could clarify that for me. Senator Kent. Madam President, again, I have done due diligence to understand this because I would not bring this forward in this manner knowing if it, if it had any sort of fiscal impact, and I have been assured that it does not. The estimate that I have been given is that it is $2 million across all agencies that has already been absorbed into those budgets. And when you think about you know, the, all the workers that are affected across all different agencies, this has been absorbed, so it is not, there is not a direct fiscal impact, and we do, it would not generate a fiscal note. Senator Benson. Madam President, Senator Kent, is there no fiscal impact in the second biennium as well? Senator Kent. Thank you, Madam President. That is what I have been assured. Um, Madam President. Senator Benson. We don't have a fiscal note on this provision, and I have a memo in front of me from the Subcommittee on Employee Relations that indicates there is some cost. And so with that, Madam President, I think we're at grave risk of putting this budget out of balance and since Senator Kent cannot produce definitive answers that there is no cost, um, I would like you to rule this amendment out of order. Madam President, 
Advice? Senator Eaton. I'm sorry, Senator Eaton. Thank you. Um, this, this contract was uh, awarded by an arbiter, arbor, arbitrator, sorry, it's getting late. Um, and it only, it ex, this contract is over in June. It's, all of it's been paid already up until this point. It only has, what, April, May, and June left of the contract. So all the funds have been paid up till now. And all we're saying is we want the, the contract that was, rat, that was a, awarded by the arbitrator to be um, confirmed by the legislature. One minute. Senator Benson, could you clarify what rule you're making your point under? Madam President, I would like you to make a ruling under 7.41 that this would increase net appropriations from a fund for fiscal biennium without a corresponding increase in net revenue. And I would point out Minnesota State estimate the cost at $2 million. Minnesota State estimated that it would need to hire replacements for essentially all the faculty who use this benefit. Senator Kent, did you have advice? Madam President, the numbers are really low. Um, if we're speaking specifically about the paid parental leave part, um, there have been just a, f a few hundred who have taken advantage of this across all agencies over the course of nearly a year that it has been in effect. Um, when you spread that across all agencies, it is hard to imagine where a $2 million number would come from. Uh, there, and as Senator Eaton observed, which was the point I was about to make, new contracts will come up and then those will be able to ad adapt to these issues at, at that time. Madam, Madam President, President advice. further advice. Um, really low. Senator Benson. Really low isn't zero. And if we're going to kick things out of committee for a couple thousand dollars, uh, I had a bill brought back to committee for a thousand dollars of transfer in the SGR. And so um, really low isn't sufficient information for this body and I believe my uh, point of order on 7.4 uh, 7 stands. Advice? Madam President. S Senator Latz. Uh, Madam President, under paragraph one of uh, rule 7.4, um, it only addresses if there are increased net appropriations. Well, there's no appropriation in this amendment. So that uh, provision doesn't even apply to the amendment that's before us. And secondly, it appears that the agencies are, are absorbing uh, within their budgets, uh, any costs that they may be incurring. So again, there's no fiscal impact. The costs are being absorbed by the agencies, such as they are. But more to the point, under 7.4 paragraph 1, it only deals with when there are appropriations, and there are no such appropriations in this amendment. So the, uh, the objection should be, uh, not be well taken. Senator Kent, advice. Thank you, Madam President. And just to further confirm, um, the $2 million that I'm looking at, and I don't have a copy of what Senator Benson is referring to, but the $2 million that I see uh, refers, again, to all agencies, um, and uh, it would be absorbed across all the agencies as, as a part of their normal operations and, and the way they manage their staff resources. Madam President. Senator Kent. Forgive me. I, it is getting late and I forgot one key detail just to confirm what was, has been discussed. And this was from the 15, fiscal 16-17 year. This was from a previous budget. This has already been, that's where the $2 million is identified. I am going to rule um, uh, Senator Benson's point is well taken and um, the A75 is out of order under our rules. Further discussion? 
Madam President. Senator Cohen. I have the uh, A109 amendment. Senator Cohen has offered the A109. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Cohen moves to amend Senate File 605 as follows. Page 2, line 28, delete. This is the A109 amendment. Uh, Madam President, move the amendment. And this deals with, uh, uh, with the House budget, uh, explicitly uh, line um, 2.28, and would offer the amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newton. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to offer the A116 amendment to the Cohn Amendment. Senator Newton has offered the A116 amendment. The Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Newton, Newton uh, moves to amend the Cohen Amendment to Senate File 605 as follows. Page 1 after line 3, insert. This is the A116 amendment. Thank you, the Madam amendment, President. Senator Newton. Uh, after uh, reflecting on this and the amount of money that we were looking for the veterans' homes, uh, what this amendment does is it adds $10 million a year uh, for the veterans' homes, which would give us plenty of money for the homes at uh, Montevideo and Bemidji, as well as the upgrades that we need in the, the Minneapolis home and the other uh, homes. Thank you, Madam President. Further discussion to the A116? Senator Rosen. Thank you, Madam President. Point of order. State your point. Thank you, Madam President. I think this is a violation, Madam President, members of uh, Rule 7.4, Paragraph 1. There is, uh, there is a sufficient number or amount of money in the carryover fund for this amendment. However, uh, Paragraph 1 states that you have to have a corresponding increase in net revenue, and that has not been uh, designated at this point. So I would ask for your ruling on this that it is out of order. Uh, ma Madam President. Senator Cohen, advice. Uh, Madam President, advice. Um, my amendment is drafted to page two of the bill, section two, legislature, uh, subdivision one, total appropriations, uh, line 2.28, House Representatives, 32,383,000 for the first year of the biennium, 32,383,000 for the second year of the biennium. My amendment deletes 16,191,000 for each year of the biennium. So clearly the amendment to the amendment fits. Uh, in fact, it fits so well, there's all sorts of money left over from my amendment. Further advice? Madam President, I'd like a roll call on the bill, on the amendment. Senator Newton, we will, we will address that. We are dealing with a point of order right now. Madam President. Senator Cohen. Would you, would you like some further advice? I, but Senator Cohen, from you, yes. Great. <laughs> Great, Madam, Madam President. That's, that's what I hoped you'd say. So let me just suggest, Madam President, I 
very quickly went over the line that my amendment represents or, or, or takes the money from. Again, let me repeat, it's page two, line 28. It's explicitly in the bill in front of us, explicitly. My amendment, now, Sarah Newman would have to speak to his amendment, but as I understand Sarah Newman's amendment uh, to the amendment, there's no question that the arithmetic works, no question. I would only suggest, Madam President, uh, having done this for a while and having been on the receiving end of a lot of these amendments, when I was the majority finance chairman, there's never been a situation that I'm aware of in the Senate ever, 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 where an amendment like this was not in order. Now, we got into that obscure debate about the carry forward, which I also thought was in order because it was in the spreadsheet. I never got the chance to say what the carry forward was, which was a little bit over $8 million, the House carry forward. But there can be no question. If members have a question, then I'd ask you to go to your computer, pull up the bill, which, by the way, is Senate File 605, go to page 2, and you'll see the dollar amount staring at your face. There has never been a situation in the Senate ever, where an amendment like this sort, which is drafted to the particular bill, the appropriations bill, does not in any way change the target of the bill at all, does it within the bill where that is not in order. You cannot come up with any custom and usage in the Senate that would suggest to the contrary. You cannot come up with another point of order that was well taken relative to the same issue ever. Um, to be fair, in discussing ever, and, and Senator Hoffman kids me about my uh, history background, my academic background, possibly we could go back, maybe there was something that happened in 1859 or 1863, I'm not aware of it. Uh, but I can tell you, in the last number of years in the Senate, this kind of an amendment has never, ever been ruled out of order, ever. Further advice? I'm going to take Senator Rosen's uh, point of order as well taken on the A116. Madam President. Senator Cohen. Point of inquiry. Could, could the um, president explain why? Yes, Senator Cohen, I will. The A116 is a separate amendment from the A109. The question was on the A116, not the combination of the two. So we were, I was, the question was on the A16 by itself, and that is what I ruled on, and I ruled the point well taken. Madam uh, President. Uh, Senator Cohen? Uh, well, Madam President, again, my, my uh, question of inquiry. Um, Senator Newman's amendment was drafted to my amendment and was drafted to the bill. Veterans are within the bill. Legislature's within the bill. So why is Senator Newman's amendment, uh, Senator Newton's amendment, apologies, why is Senator Newton's amendment um, out of order? Senator Cohen, I ruled on the A116 amendment. That is what is before us, the A116. Yes. Senator Newton's amendment, to my understanding, is the A109. The A116 is an amendment to the amendment. Yours is the no. A109. No, Madam President, I have the 109 amendment, yes. Senator Newton's was the 116 amendment to the amendment. Did I, I'm sorry, did I turn my numbers around? I, the A116 was Senator Newton's amendment to your amendment. And the question was on the A16, which is the amendment before us. And that is the one I ruled on. So right now, then I, we have the A109 before us. No, and Madam President, I understand, I guess, um, and we're getting kind of confused between 116, 109, and uh, whatever other numbers we want to toss around. Madam President, I understand that you ruled that Senator 
Newton's 116 amendment was out of order. That was my point of inquiry as to why that was out of order. And Senator Cohen, I believe I explained that we take it as an amendment, not as the combination of the two. The A116 changes the appropriation. There isn't the, the when you take the A109, you can't take them in combination when you are ruling on the A116. That was the question before us, was the A116, not the combination of the two. Madam President, yeah. and and I am reminded that the uh, that that has been it has been ruled the A one sixteen under the under seven point four subdivision one. I've ruled that out of order, and we have the one A one hundred nine in front of us. Well, Madam President, I. I I would, I would uh, uh, appeal the ruling of the chair and would ask for roll call. The ruling of the chair has been appealed and roll call has been requested. <coughs> the question is, shall the decision of the president be the judgment of the Senate? A green vote will sustain the ruling of the president. A red vote will overrule the ruling of the president. The secretary will take the roll. All those, vote, all those senators having voted who desire to vote the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 33 nays, the ruling of the president has been sustained. We have Madam in front president. of us the A109. We have in front of us Senator Cohen. Your, Senator Cohen, your A109 is in front of us. Madam President, uh, the amendment I have is, as you mentioned, in front of us. I hope members will vote for it. Madam President. Senator Lurie. I have the A110 amendment to Senator Cohen's A109 amendment. Senator Lurie has offered the A110 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Lurie moves to amend Senate File 605. As follows, page one after line three, insert. This is the A110 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Lorry. Uh, Madam President, um, uh, as this bill came before the Finance Committee, it had stricken the um, Olmstead Planning Office at the Department of Administration. I actually uh, greatly appreciate the reinstatement of the first year of that funding uh, by Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, but one year of funding is not enough for this critical um, function. This amendment reinstates the $148,000 in the FY19. FY19 base budget for the Department of Admin. Uh, the amendment is balanced with uh, uh, the um, A109 amendment of Senator Cohen's. The 148,000 per year provides two employees to provide research and policy analysis to state agencies related to integrating people with disabilities into professional positions at state agencies. The Olmstead Plan is a public's plan for implementing our obligation to provide individuals with disabilities opportunities to live, work, and be supported in the most integrated settings appropriate to their needs and their desires. Uh, one of the goals of the Olmstead Plan is to provide Minnesotans with disabilities the opportunity to engage in productive employment and in particular in 
public agencies. To this end, the Department of Admin Administration was provided resources to help state agencies comply with the Olmstead Plan and integrate Minnesotans with disabilities into professional life. It bears noting that Minnesota ranks 34th in the public employment rate of people with developmental disabilities, and our state can and should improve the number of Minnesotans with disabilities employed by the state, and the funding for the Department of Admin helps to provide that data analysis and support to continue with this important work and improve on this uh, standing. I uh, would ask for member support on the A110 amendment. Further discussion to the A110. Senator Kipmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Laurie, I appreciate this and your thoughtfulness, but as you know, uh, we have funded this 148000 the first year. We enable them to also uh, use these funds over the entire biennium, so they have flexibility here. There are other agencies <clears throat> in specific uh, that are uh, delegated and have the responsibility and the duty to implement and to take care of the Olmstead Amendment, and they are doing a very good job of that within those agencies. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, uh, Madam President, and uh, this uh, interesting evening's experiences. I, just to the whole underlying idea, I don't know the productivity in the Senate taking the House's money. I used to live there, and I, I don't know that this is going to make a more productive bill. And while I think that Senator Lorry has a, a worthy item to spend the money on, I think it's a bad idea. And, and just because we spent a whole time going through our other budget bills, and so um, if anybody votes no on this and they get criticized for not uh, supporting the Olmstead world, I don't think that's what this vote's about. Um, and so I plan to vote no, and I urge members to uh, show some respect for the, uh, ho the House the way we hope they show respect for us. And I, I think this whole line of uh, amendments, if there's 16 of them, is beneath us, and we should just get done with this part. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Senator Lurie, for bringing this forward. This is not a bad idea. The, the Department of Administration is supposed to oversee the whole Olmstead Cabinet uh, administration. And when you look at what the Olmstead Cabinet's about, let's go back to 1999 when there were two young women who wanted to live in the community, work in the community, and have their own place to live. And they were told by their team, nope, not going to happen. And it took the Supreme Court to say that people with disabilities have an active right in the state in the state and to the nation to live where they want to live and work where they want to live. Minnesota at the time could have done an Olmstead plan like other states did, but it took 16 years for Minnesota to put their Olmstead plan together. So we're not just talking about $149,000 for the Department of Administration. That Olmstead plan that is put in place and administered through this agency is something that is under federal watch through a federal judge. If you recall, Minnesota didn't want to do the Olmstead plan for 16, 17 years, and it took a decision that was based upon the Meadows settlement. Anybody want to look that up? It was a three and a half million dollar lawsuit to the state of Minnesota that was taken on behalf of people with disabilities. It was a classified, certified class action lawsuit. And based on that, the, the deciding judge said Minnesota must implement an Olmstead plan. And that had to be administered. Yes, there are other agencies that are involved in that plan, Madam President and members, but it has to be administered by a one agency. And if you take this money away, you're going to take away the whole process. And I want not to say I told you so, but there's going to be an attorney that's going to line up and say, Minnesota, what are you doing? You're going to go backwards instead of forward. So please, members, support this. This means $149,000 to assure people with disabilities have a right to live in the community and work in the community. So please, I suggest, and I hope that you honor and support this. Thank you, Madam President and members. Senator Benson. Thank you, Madam President. And you know, the Olmstead plan has to be woven through all of the ways we serve people with disabilities. And so I think uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has, has given them a timeline to, to push those ideas out, to work with the various departments and agencies so that it can be fully integrated into the way we serve people with disabilities and then become part of the way we live normally and not just implemented because there's a federal requirement. And so I want to... Um, 
thank Senator Kiffmeyer for, for pushing this out and respect Senator Lori wanting to keep a close eye on this. It is important, but I think this can be um, woven into the way we care for people with disabilities. And um, I would ask members respectfully to oppose this amendment. Madam President, I'd like to request a roll call. Roll call has been requested, roll call granted. Further discussion on the A110. Seeing none, the secretary will take the roll on the A110 amendment. Those senators having voted who desire to vote the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Back to the A109. Oh. Oh. Senator Isaacson. Oh. Up, oh. Sen. I wanted one. I was standing. I just. I want it. Senator Hoffman. Senator Isaacson has. Thank you, Madam President. It has been a long day. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't get any longer. So, uh, but Madam President, I have the, the A113 amendment. Senator Hoffman has offered the A113 amendment and it is written to the A109. It is an amendment to the amendment. Thank you, Madam President. It is uh, an amendment Senator, to the, the amendment. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Hoffman moves to amend the Cohen amendment to Senate file 605 as follows, page one after line three. Insert, this is the A113 amendment. To the Madam, amendment, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. Didn't mean to talk before you told me to. So, uh, the, the amendment to the amendment uh, takes, uh, um, moves money from the, the other body on the base budget and the accommodations reimbursement fund. Let me tell you about the accommodations reimbursement fund. As you recall, we've had a, a history of, of governors in Minnesota that wanted to increase the employment of people with disabilities in state government. Our, our, our latest governor, Governor Mark Dayton, wanted to increase that, I believe, to 7%. And we had spent a lot of time looking at different programs, pathways to employment, when it was 2.5% to 5%. But what really matters is, as you're looking at getting people with disabilities working within state government jobs, you would hire somebody and get a reasonable accommodation and end up um, that reasonable accommodation would cost their bottom line. So there was really a disincentive, a disincentive for hiring people with disabilities. And so this, this uh, reimbursement, um, the state agency accommodation reimbursement fund was created to do that. Now just real quickly, uh, Madam Chair, Madam President and members, just in the past two years, the accommodations fund has reimbursed agencies for 88 different accommodations for state employees. Here's the kicker. Last year it was unable to reimburse agencies for just over $90,000 in the first year. 
And so when you squeeze this thing in half, you're saying, on one hand, yeah, I want people with disabilities working in state government, but when you talk about a reasonable accommodation that's not going to get down to their costing of their general fund, but actually is going to be there to help, then it's there. And, and I think it's important that we really look at that, because we don't want to disin disincentivize state agencies to hire people with disabilities. And so, Madam, uh, Chair, Madam President and, and members, you know, on behalf of uh, helping a central accommodation fund and recommending what are best practices for hiring more people with disabilities, um, I, I think it'd be important that we support this. We're talking about a small amount of money here. And just like the last amendment that I had, you know, if we're really true about our values and we mean all, we include all, we want to talk about all, we want to make it right for people with disabilities, this is going to be very helpful because it helps us within the state of Minnesota. So please, members, vote green and uh, thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, in response to Senator Hoffman in this regard, I'll remind you that in this bill, we reformed this particular area, reminding ourselves that state law currently requires any employer, any agency, irrespective of any other grant program, any other thing, that the specific agency and employer is required by law to make reasonable accommodation. And it's not dependent upon another grant program. It's something that they do. And to kind of somehow say that if we don't have this grant program that the state agencies might not make that reasonable accommodation, I don't think that's really fair to say that about these agencies. Also, just to remind you members that in regards to this bill, uh, we did a 50% match which means that, in essence, there is basically the same amount of funding, but that it does help uh, in regards to these agencies. We're glad to provide that. But it is 50% uh, from the agency itself and 50% from this grant fund. And therefore, those monies are actually doubled in its effectiveness, and it preserves the responsibility of the originating agency to make that reasonable accommodation irrespective of a grant. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. And, and thank you, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. You're absolutely right when you talk about reasonable accommodations because under the ADA and under the 504 of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act from 1973, you are absolutely correct. And we should be making reasonable accommodations for all people in order to make that, uh, that, uh, that uh, place of employment more inclusive. Here's the one thing that, that, it, that it doesn't address. When we're talking about accommodations such as special desks or screen reading software or sign language interpreters, that's, that's what this money comes into play, which is, uh, which is something that, uh, unfortunately, uh, we did hear uh, in, in the other body a gentleman who had testified um, because of the ability to have a sign language interpreter for the, for the job that he does, and he's successful, and he's absolutely being fully active and participating. So members, again, I would, I would hope that you look beyond just the fact that a reasonable accommodation, but these are really, really good accommodations that, that really gives some folks uh, uh, an equal playing field. So please vote for this. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Abler. Thank you, uh, Madam President and members. And, and Senator Hoffman, you know I have a, more respect for you than you, you probably know that. But I just don't understand the point in setting off a war with the House on this funding source. I just don't understand it. I don't understand how this body, which is so respectful of those people with disabilities and the special needs they have, and has a history of in every Senate bill they put forward, strongly representing those needs to turn them into a pawn in the fight with the House. I just don't understand that. And members, um, out of respect for the people we're saying we serve, I urge members to vote no on this and not get involved in this particular topic about setting off a fight with the House. And it's not productive. And I think when you look at how we've uh, structured the bill we'll be talking about next week, where we're deeply committed to people with disabilities, the frail elderly, and kids, that those priorities are going to be strong. And if anybody tells you because you voted no on this bill or voted yes that you care or do not care about somebody with a special need, I'm going to tell them that they're wrong. We care. But I will not encourage people to set off a war with the House. Just because they decided to cut our budget does not make it a better thing to, set the, to go to war with them. Someone has to be the upper body. 
Someone has to be the adult in the room, and someone has to say, no, we're not going to do that. Members, please vote no. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. Just say no. I'm not saying just say no, members, because the House, the other body, has taken $4.9 million from the budget, from the Senate budget. Let me just say that again. The House, the other body, has taken $4.9 million. So this isn't about the tit for tat on who took what or who didn't take what or leveraging taking Peter to take from Paul. What I'm talking about is really looking at if we truly value and care about employment of people with disabilities in the state of Minnesota, then we will stand up. This is a measly small amount of money that we're talking about here. So, so set aside the fact of whether or not we're getting into a fight with the House, because we're not getting into a fight with the House. And I think we'd win anyway, but that's just my biased opinion. But I think this really looks at the fact they already took some of our money. Let's just get this back to the table, because this is what we owe people. This is what we owe. We owe a bill. Let's pay the bill. Let's not get in trouble for this. I really want to see this passed. Thank you, Madam President and members. Senator Westrom. Uh, Madam President, uh, members, uh, Senator Hoffman, uh, thanks for uh, bringing this amendment up, but uh, I think it's a good opportunity for us to uh, look at what this bill does. Uh, Senator Hoffman's uh, amendment would go back to the 400000 as we look for ways to uh, change the way state government works. Uh, this bill has 200000 of what was used to be a $400,000 accommodation account. But it sets up a, a challenge or a match from other agencies to pay half the cost. Uh, but members, let's step back and contemplate this. This account, in essence, says state government doesn't even follow the law, the federal ADA law, and it's so bad that we have actually had to set up a separate account even to get government to hire people with disabilities. Think about that, members. That's pretty sad. It's supposed to be government implements these laws and then follows them. And instead, we've got agencies complaining that they have to take money out of their budgets to make reasonable accommodations. The bill scales back to a 50% match, but it is something the state agencies shouldn't even be questioning in their interviews, nor does the law allow them to be questioning this. But we've set up a fund and basically given agencies a free pass to ignore the law and do something that they should have been doing from the beginning, which is paying for reasonable accommodations. So members, there's a lot more to digest here. I don't think it's the time to get into it right now. But think about the message we're sending as state government and the way they're going to hire more people with disabilities is if we don't make them follow the law. But all the private sector, all the communities in our districts have to follow the law without an accommodations account paid for. And we expect them to do that. We ought to raise the expectations on state government as well. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Madam President. I, I thank you, Tori. I absolutely, Senator Senator Westrom. I absolutely agree with you 100% that we should be following federal law, and we are following federal law. Our problem is that we end up utilizing and using that money against the bottom line for the agencies. And look what we're doing. We're having a conversation, members, about, well, there's not enough money in this fund or there's not enough money in that fund. But let me just be very clear. There are private businesses and other government units that use central accommodation funds. And I'm going to name them for you. IBM, Microsoft, SunTrust, federal government, state of Massachusetts, and the University of Minnesota. So no, this just isn't just one little state that does it. Um, I agree with Senator Westrom, and I agree with Senator Abler 99.8% of the time, and I agree with them on this piece. However, folks, if we truly, really, really want to make a difference, then just fund this. We're talking about a measly $200,000 a year. Thank you. Further discussion on the A113 amendment.
Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. The secretary will take the roll on the A113. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. We have before us the A109, Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to offer the A111 amendment to the amendment. Senator Isaacson has offered the A111. The secretary will report the amendment. So, uh, just yep. one one four. One one one. One eleven. Senator Isaacson moves to amend the Cohen Amendment to Senate File Number Six O Five as follows. Page one after line three insert. This is the A one eleven amendment. To the amendment, Senator Isaacson. Would Senator Kiffmeyer yield for a question? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Uh, My question is uh, regarding uh, Article 2, Section 36. Uh, my understanding is that this amendment was brought forth in uh, good faith because there was a particular person or individual uh, who was a veteran, I believe, that did not get to, um, that could not opt out of our insurance. Is that, is that was that the genesis of this uh, amendment or this, this language in the bill? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. I'm just uh, trying to find oh, sure. a oh, place in the uh, bill that is being referenced. So page one, after line three, insert page 24. Okay, thank you, Madam President. I'm Senator Kiffmeyer. Okay, uh, would uh, I be glad to yield uh, for a question? I think, would Senator mind? Isaacson, could you repeat the question? No problem, thank you. Uh, my understanding, Senator Kiffmeyer, is that, um, and rightly so, this bill was brought forward in good faith, or this, this language was, because there was a gentleman that was being forced to pay, pay uh, premiums that wasn't using the insurance. Is that, is my understanding correct in terms of the genesis of this language? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this bill was presented in my committee, and as to that sort of genesis, I have no knowledge of that kind of genesis or that sort of history whatsoever. I took the language in the bill on its face and the fiscal note that came with it. Senator Isaacson. And uh, would Senator Kiffmeyer yield another question? Senator Kiffmeyer, will you yield? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Kiffmeyer, was the uh, was the Senator Goggins that brought this bill originally? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, if you're asking who is the author of the Section 39 language, that would be Senator Goggin. Thank you. Senator Isaacson. Would Senator Goggin yield to a question, please? Senator Goggin will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Goggin, the same question to you was the... Senator Isaacson, oh, please address the president. 
So, Madam yes. President, thank you. Uh, was the thank you for that clarification? Was the genesis of this bill related, as I had previously stated, that there was a gentleman who was being uh, forced to pay premiums that wasn't using the insurance and didn't have an option to opt out? Is that correct, Senator Goggin? You're asking, uh, thank you, Madam President. You're asking if there was a gentleman that had a uh, question to opt out. Is that what I'm, I'm trying to understand your question, Senator Isaacson? Senator Isaacson. Happy to repeat it. Thank you, Madam President. Um, my understanding when I did some research on this language and asked around, including in a different body of our government, was that this particular language was brought forward because there was a gentleman who was locked into paying CGIP premiums that wasn't using our insurance and that we were trying to offer or the legislature was offering a way so that individual didn't have to pay the insurance. Uh, it, I'm just wondering if that is your understanding or not. Senator Goggin. Uh, Madam President, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know that individual that you're talking about, but I do know that there's, I had a number of people uh, when I was out on the campaign trail that are government employees that did ask because they are doing it, getting insurance elsewhere that they not have to pay the insurance to the state. But I do not know of any particular individual that you're referring to. Senator Isaacson. Would Senator Goggin yields again? Senator Goggin will yield, Senator Isaacson. Madam President, could you give me an approximation of how many people on the campaign trail you heard asked you about this? Senator Goggin. More than one. Senator, Senator, Senator Isaacson. Senator Goggin yield again? Yes. Senator Goggin will yield, Senator Isaacson. Less than 40? Quite Senator possibly. Uh, Madam <laughs> President. You can pick any number, Senator Isaacson, you'd like to have. I, I did not keep a, a, a diary of the exact number of people that asked that on the campaign trail. Senator Isaacson. Madam President, well, I appreciate that. So we're going to choose the number 20, I think, is the number we're going to go with then uh, for the purpose of this discussion. So it is my understanding this language was brought forward, and the way it was presented in the other body was quite clearly about individuals in a very small subset that are targeted in a way where they can't opt out of their insurance. And this language is to give them that opportunity. I think this is an example of an amendment that shows government being responsive, right? This language was. However, then it went a little south. And so what it does now is not only does it talk about 4,000 people who are eligible for this situation out of like 120,000. But of those 4,000, the number 600 was bandied about as being the amount that actually may take advantage of this option. And in doing so, there was a question about whether or not there'd be a savings that then comes along with the, uh, people opting out. And a fiscal note was developed based on the number that was given of 600 or approximately 15% of the 4,000. What I'm concerned about is this, and what my amendment tries to fix is this. <clears throat> the provision applies to capture that money and then ask them to reduce their budgets by 15% across the board in some state agencies applies to the executive branch and constitutional officers, but it does not apply to the legislative branch, the judicial branch, the Minnesota colleges, the university system, or about 40% of the other employees covered by CGIP. So in essence, what happened is we had a well-intended amendment that came along and then was asked. And from that amendment came along a fiscal note. And the fiscal note seemed to indicate approximately, possibly, around 600 people might take advantage of opting out. And was there going to be a savings from that? And then that savings was captured, which sounds suspiciously like dynamic scoring, and then used to ask the agencies to cut their budget on the possibility that 600 people are going to opt out. The problem is that 600 people may not come from that part of the government that's applied to the budget cut. In fact, it's entirely possible that the 600 people might come outside of the area the bill enumerates the cuts need to come from. And if that then happens, what we're telling you is that the 
the um, executive branch, the constitutional officers, offices or, or, uh, uh, and their departments will have to provide for another cut to their budget without realizing any of the savings the fiscal note says we're supposed to, we're supposed to have. So what my amendment does is fixes that because I am concerned that we are asking for money on what we call dynamic scoring, which I think some people here might be a little uncomfortable with. Not only that, it targets specific agencies and not others. So that even the savings we might realize won't actually go into the pots we're trying to cut in the budget. And it creates a real problem for us. So I'm very concerned about that. And so I offered an amendment to fix that. And I hope that you'll accept and uh, vote yes. Thank you. For the discussion, Senator Goggin. Thank you, Madam President. So in other words, what Senator Isaacson is saying that is we're gonna force these employees to pay for insurance that they don't need, and so we're gonna to continue to make them make those payments based on the assumption that he's, question, he's calling into question the uh, MMB uh, fiscal note. And so uh, if he wants to go ahead and force these employees to pay for uh, insurance that they don't want to have and that they don't need to have, uh, I don't see why we in the government should be forcing these people to uh, maintain coverage, duplicate coverage, when, we're, when they're not wanting to. Senator Isaacson. Madam President, I really appreciate uh, Senator Goggin's comments because it helps me clarify the amendment that apparently I wasn't clear about. They can still opt out with my amendment. We're just not going to pretend to capture savings that aren't there. We're still allowing them to opt out. We're just saying you can't capture savings that don't exist. Not only that, we're asking certain departments to capture savings that other departments don't need to capture. So it seems bizarrely targeted to me in a way that I'm not sure is fair to our state employees and our departments that work very hard on our behalf to make sure our state is as amazing as it is. And so it seems a little bit random to me when we look at this, especially considering the savings that are actually caught which the fiscal note is based on, the savings that are actually caught aren't actually gonna be in the areas that we're asking to cut. That doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm sorry that I wasn't clear before, Senator Goggins, but you still absolutely can opt out and not have to pay for that. So don't worry, the 20 people you spoke to on the campaign trail are gonna be good. But I wanna make sure that we take the time to recognize we're trying to, save, we're trying to capture a savings that we do not know if it'll exist and then we're only capturing in some parts and punishing certain, certain departments while letting other departments go without having to acknowledge the savings they may or may not have. So I'm hoping that you'll accept my amendment that we don't try to do that. Thank you. Senator Goggin. Thank you, Madam President. Um, well, first off, I want to correct the record. I did not say 20. That's what Senator Isaacson is assuming. Uh, I, I could not uh, uh, give a, a, a number exact like 20. So I'll let him uh, just use whatever number he uh, fictitiously wants to use. But we're trying to force, if we continue down this path, we're forcing employees of the state to make payments for insurance that they don't need, that they don't want, and that I encourage everyone here to vote no on this amendment because this is just ridiculous that we're forcing employees to have to make a monthly payment on insurance that they don't need and regardless of how Senator Isaacson wants to look at it, it's savings to the state, the state of Minnesota. And I encourage everyone to vote no. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Madam President. And Senator Goggins, again, I was not clear. So allow me to be crystal clear. They absolutely, positively, under this language, are still entirely able to opt out if they would like. So let's be clear about that narrative. I'm gonna say it again they absolutely positively can still opt out. All I'm saying is you can't try to capture a fictitious savings that may or may not be there. The best news is, is if those folks opt out, then there will be a savings, hallelujah. But the reality is, is that my amendment does not in any way tell them they can't opt out. So I wanna be really clear about that, they absolutely can opt out still, my amendment does not speak to that. My amendment speaks to the savings that's involved and whether or not we're going to erroneously try to capture something we're entirely unsure about. 
in a process that I think with fiscal dynamic scoring, we seem to be very uncomfortable with here in the Senate. Senator Isaacson. I would like a roll call, please. Thank you, ma'am. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Uh, Secretary will take the roll on the A111. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion on the A109, Senator Cohen. Well, Madam President, um, I guess we're back to the original amendment. Um, I don't know what to do. I, I, uh, I had hoped that uh, members of the body would consider uh, my giving them an opportunity to uh, try to help the bill a little bit. Uh, I know there's a lot of discussion about targets and, and availability of money. Um, I, like I, I hope every other member of the Senate is, is not pleased when the other body uh, deals with our budget. I, I thought uh, you know, this wasn't meant to be uh, you know, tit for tat, but uh, I thought that there was an opportunity both to improve the bill. I think certainly we listened to Senator Lori uh, talk about uh, the Olmsted money, something highly critical to the state. Senator Hoffman uh, was articulate in presenting uh, his amendment to the amendment. Um, uh, Madam President, uh, you and I have been colleagues and friends now for a number of years, and I, I, I guess I, I just stand on the floor just, I guess I'm beaten down. I'm withdraw the amendment, I guess. Senator Cohn withdraws his amendment. <laughs> Further discussion to Senate File 605. I don't think that can be beat, Senator Cohn. Further discussion. Secretary will give Senate File 605 its third, re third reading. Oh, I have an amendment, uh, Madam okay. President. Uh, is amendment A117. Senator Newton offers the A117 amendment. The secretary yeah. will report the amendment. Senator Newton offers an amendment to Senate file number 605 as follows. Page 2, line 28, delete. This is the A17, excuse me, A117 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Newton. Thank you, Madam President. I haven't been beaten down yet. I'm still looking for funds for the uh, veterans' homes. And uh, this will take approximately 50% of the funding that is on line two, uh, or uh, page two, uh, line 28. And we're still going to take, uh, use the, those funds uh, for the veterans' homes. Further discussion to the A-17? Or you, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Madam President? Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Madam President. 
I'm sorry, Madam President, just give me a moment here. I had Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted Senator to be sure. Kittmeyer. Thank you, Madam President. This is, again, the same issue of taking money from the other body. Uh, granted, I think Senator Abler spoke very well to this and I think addressed the issue of us being respectful of the other body and that I think it is time for us, we have another bill uh, to work on this evening and I think this would be a situation where uh, working on taking money away from the other body uh, to do this. Uh, Senator Newton, I know that in the Veterans Affairs Committee there was a unanimous vote for this portion of the bill in regards to uh, both veterans and military affairs. I'm sure that in the future uh, there will be bills such as capital investment and other ones where uh, items like this would be very appropriate. But taking money from the other body, I think, has been addressed quite well here. And I do not support this amendment. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Newton. Uh, thank you, Madam President and Senator Kiffmeyer. I think the other body does not hesitate to uh, remove funding for this body uh, in their bill. And I would like to have a roll call on this, uh, Madam President. Roll call requested. Roll call granted. Further discussion? Senator Benson. Madam President, just because the other body did it doesn't mean we should do it. Next thing you know, people will be walking around without ties on. <laughs> so I would oppose this amendment. The Secretary will take the roll on the A117. All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion on Senate File 605? <laughs> Senator Newton. Thank you, Madam President. I, I'll get off the subject of veterans' homes for a minute. I'd like to uh, propose uh, uh, Amendment A49. Senator Newton has offered the offered the A49 amendment. The Secretary will report Senator the Newton amendment. Senator Newton moves to amend Senate File 605 as follows, page 30, line, delete section 10. This is the A49 amendment. This Discussion uh, to the A49, Senator Newton. Thank you, Madam President. This amendment no. uh, removes Article 2, section 10, line 30.15 from the uh, uh, Senate File 605. And what it does is uh, that that section shifts decision-making authority in contested cases relating to the uh, Veterans Preference Act to the Office of Administrative Hearings for Administrative Law Judge Disposition. And uh, this amendment, by, by eliminating that section, keeps those, any decision relating to uh, the Veterans Preference Act with the, the Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and the reason is, is that the Commissioner of Veterans Affairs has more knowledge and a better understanding of veterans' issues than uh, an administrative law judge would, would have. So um, we don't want to take the veterans' preference issues out of the, the uh, hands of the Commissioner of the Department of uh, uh, Minnesota Department of Veterans Affairs. And it's a pretty simple amendment. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like a roll call on it, please. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. Further discussion to the A49 amendment. Senator New Newman. 
Madam President, uh, uh, I would urge members to uh, reject the uh, the uh, A49 amendment. Uh, in terms of the final decision-making authority of, a, of an administrative law judge, uh, some of the reasons why uh, that is in this bill is, is number one, it's a cost-saving measure. Currently, uh, in those types of cases where uh, the commissioner retains the authority to overrule the administrative law judge, uh, the, what happens is after a trial, or after a hearing, evidence is uh, uh, considered, the administrative law judge issues an order, and the commissioner then uh, effectively overrules the administrative law judge, having then made the decision for the second time in a row on a particular issue. Uh, from there, uh, once that, uh, uh, once that uh, uh, overruling of the administrative law judge occurs, then there is an, a right of appeal to the Court of Appeals. It, in my, my way of thinking, is a completely unnecessary step uh, and is uh, simply uh, a waste of time and money on behalf of the litigants. The other thing that I would, I would indicate is often uh, we hear that the commissioner uh, should be able to retain this authority to overrule the administrative law judge because the commissioner has more expertise in the area than an ALJ. And I would dispute that. Uh, commissioners come and go just like senators come and go and just like uh, governors come and, go, come and go. And in reality, what the uh, a commissioner is relying on is folks who are full-time, long-time employees with a particular agency. The same thing can be true uh, with an ALJ, allowing an ALJ to rely on the expertise of an expert that would come in and give the ALJ uh, advice. So in reality, uh, in either case, the fact finder is the one that is getting advice from someone with more knowledge. And frankly, I will tell you, it's something that is very common in uh, civil litigation to allow uh, uh, expert testimony to come in and, and give advice to the fact finder. Um, and the final thing I would say is this. When it comes to uh, final decision-making authority, keep in mind that the state agency writes the rules, the state agency then investigates violations of the rules that they have just uh, written, then the agency uh, adjudicates whether or not a violation has occurred of those rules and then sets the penalty or the fine or the sanction. To my way of thinking, there's always been just too much uh, uh, closeness in terms of all of that authority uh, uh, residing in the hands of a single person. And uh, it isn't a violation uh, of, the, of, say, the constitutional separation of powers, but in, certainly in my mind, it is a violation of the spirit of the separation of, po of powers. And the reality of it is, is that before one of our constituents, who is the subject of one of these contested cases, uh, has a neutral set of eyes on the decision-making uh, process, is when they get to the Court of Appeals. Uh, and so for those reasons, members, I would urge that you reject uh, uh, Senator Newton's amendment. Further discussion to the A49 amendment? Senator Mr. President, Newton. very briefly, in, uh, the, even though the, uh, the commissioner uh, it comes and goes, as you say, uh, in effect, these people are generally uh, selected for their military experience before they're uh, appointed to the position of uh, uh, commissioner of uh, the Department of Military Affairs. They also, because of that, have had experience with general courts martial and courts martial authorities and, and have dealt with issues like this. So it's not that they're, they're not understanding of, of court procedures. Uh, and so, again, I uh, encourage a green vote. Thank you. Any further discussion to the amendment? Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the A49 amendment.
All those senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion to Senate File 605. Senator Isaacson. Thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to offer the A34 amendment. Senator Isaacson moves the A34 amendment. The secretary will report the amendment. Senator Isaacson moves to amend Senate File 605. As follows, page 40, delete section 29. This is the A34 amendment. To the amendment, Senator Isaacson. Uh, just briefly, I would like to uh, note that uh, Senator Benson's comments may have been in some way meant in my direction. I want to highlight my TIE fighter Star Wars tie in case anybody wonders if I'm wearing a tie. It's just we're on the same page. Thank you. Uh, the A34 amendment. Um, this was a confusing one. I had to spend some serious time studying this and asking questions to really understand exactly what lines 40.6 to 40.8 were trying to accomplish. I called uh, management and budget, called the council, talked to our folks, and I've come to the conclusion that it isn't actually necessary. Um, and I say that for two reasons. One. Uh, agencies cannot spend more than is already appropriated to them. And they're limited by our appropriate appropriations uh, decisions that we make about appropriations. And finally, the legislature has the final say on all employee contracts as we are required by law to ratify them. So I'm a little concerned about the argument they make that it's trying to limit an increase in compensation, if we don't want compensation to go up, we don't ratify the contract. That's how that works. So I'm not sure I understand uh, why this is even necessary or what the purpose of this part of the, the bill is at all. And so I would encourage us uh, to just simply repeal it because there's no need for it uh, and it doesn't entitle us to do something we couldn't already do and that we couldn't already manage. And so uh, let's make this bill a little cleaner. Thanks. Discussions to the A34 amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And members, in regards to this amendment, it's really straightforward. You can't negotiate uh, to spend more than you have. It's called live within your means. Uh, if your means uh, are the approved spending plan, uh, then that is the amount of money that you should be uh, negotiating for and living within your means in regards to the contract. It has nothing to do with the amount that employees are paid for uh, or whatever those amounts might be, but in some total, if the agency has an appropriation that covers this much money, we need to be sure that we don't uh, uh, bind them to something that they do not have the money to pay for. Senator Isaacson. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, I mean, the language actually says a public employee may not contract to pay more, so it is entirely about how much more we're paying. And the reality is, is all the things that uh, the good Senator Kiffmeyer has said, we already have the capability of doing. So I'm really, again, don't understand the purpose of this language. It doesn't actually serve a functional purpose, nor does it empower us to do anything different than we've already done. So why would we add redundant language in there uh, when it's just unnecessary? And I haven't heard a reason of why it's in there or how it applies to the, to the powers we have already or how it changes that. So uh, I, again, would encourage you uh, to remove this language because it doesn't uh, serve any purpose. Thank you. Senator Limmer. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator, uh, perhaps uh, I can give you an example. As you might recall, yesterday we presented the Judiciary and Public Safety Budget proposal. We had to recognize $9.2 million in a deficiency account, money that was spent and obligated, but no money was really provided. So we had to take money out of this year's uh, target in order to pay for that last obligation. That's what Senator Kiffmeyer is trying to prevent. 
And that's why you have that written in black and white in the bill. Senator Isaacson. Would Senator Limmer yield to a question? Senator Limmer will yield, Senator Isaacson. Well, Senator Limmer, it sure, oh, excuse me, Mr. President, it sure sounds like uh, um, Senator Limmer has a really good understanding of this. I'm assuming that he heard, he got that understanding from the hearing it received in state government, is that correct? Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Isaacson, um, I uh, am not a member of the state government committee. But that fact remains that uh, we really shouldn't be going down the path of deficiency uh, bills. That shouldn't even be an existing element. But sometimes it does occur due to uh, reasons that are sometimes beyond our control. But I think Senator Kiffmeyer is trying to head that off the best possible way, tighten up our uh, accounting a little bit, and make sure that uh, the money that we, that we uh, say is going to be spent in a certain direction should be that as, as a line in the sand. If there is an emergency of some sort, uh, we can address that at a later time. It's not always perfect, but it's a goal that we should achieve. Senator Isaacson. Yes, would Senator Kiffmeyer yield to a question, please? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Kiffmeyer, um, can you just confirm with me if this language was ever heard in your committee in a hearing? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, this language was heard in a hearing in my committee. Senator Isaacson. Senator Kiffmeyer, could you tell me what bill was offered to represent this language? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I don't recall that there was a bill in regards to this. Senator Isaacson. Well, um, perhaps there's a, a mistake, but um, I'm pretty sure this was not heard in committee. And uh, that, again, is another problem, considering the arguments I've heard uh, made over and over again from my friends on the other side of the aisle about how important it is to vet these things. And uh, we did not hear this language in committee. And so uh, I'm a little concerned about that. And uh, again, I say to you, all the things that have been mentioned so far are the power we already have. So I have yet to hear why we're offering this language. Because all the things that we're talking about here, we already have the power to do. So I'm not sure why we're offering it. And I, I can say that over and over again. Uh, but I don't want to waste too much time, but I'm hoping that uh, we'll take the time to not pass legislation that was not heard in committee and now uh, is going to make redundant language and frankly, in my mind, seems to limit the ability to pay state employees more. And I think that's a problem. So I hope that uh, you'll take that into consideration. I'd love to have your support on this amendment and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. Just to clarify, Mr. President, uh, this did have a hearing, and the bill number is 605. I have the list in front of me. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I'm just trying to get a clarification so I understand uh, what this amendment would do. Uh, Senator Limmer mentioned um, that uh, it sounds like the point of this amendment is to avoid situations where we have a deficiency expenditure. Um, if, if I understood correctly, and perhaps Senator Limmer could clarify for me or someone else, but if I understood correctly, then uh, the Department of Corrections would not have been authorized to uh, spend the money on offender health care that created the deficiency that we dealt with in the judiciary budget. Is, is that the implication if this amendment or, or if this uh, provision in the bill were to become law? You're asking if Senator Limmer will yield? I guess perhaps I ought to ask Senator Limmer since he's the one who made the point most clearly for me, I think. Yes, will Senator Limmer yield? Senator Limmer will yield. Senator Limmer. Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Could Senator Latz repeat the question? Senator Latz. Uh, yes, so thank you, Mr. President. Senator Limmer, um, as I understood it, you said that the point of the language in the bill was to avoid 
deficiency spending. Um, so in the case of the judiciary budget where we had a $9 million deficiency item for offender health care, uh, would that mean that if the language that's in the underlying bill here had been law that at the time that the Department of Corrections would not have been able to spend the health care services um, that was provided to the offenders in prison? Senator Limmer. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Latz, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I do know that there's obligations that are created uh, during a budget cycle that is not covered by legislative budgets. I think Senator Giffmeyer is trying to avoid that. I did say in my earlier comments that sometimes that cannot be avoided, but nevertheless, it should be a goal of ours to make sure that we do not go in that direction and we try to avoid that. Senator Latz. Uh, so Mr. President, uh, perhaps Senator Kiffmeyer would know the answer to my question. Senator Kiffmeyer yield. Kiffmeier yield. Yeah, thank you, yield. Mr. President. And what question is it that Senator Latz is asking? I, um, he didn't ask a question that I am aware of to me. Senator Latz. Uh, Mr. President, Senator Kiffmeyer, is the purpose of the language that is in your bill in Section 29 to prohibit agencies from incurring expenditures that would end up being deficiency items in a subsequent budget? Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Latz. And so in regards to how uh, we get to a certain point where this would be in effect, so we are here in the process today of setting an appropriation uh, by May 23rd or sometime before around that, we would have an appropriation to an agency. Uh, they then establish a spending plan in accordance with Section 16A.14. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, generally there are contracts that would be negotiated. At that point, the language in this bill says, may not contract to pay more to employees in compensation and benefits in a biennium than is permitted under an approved spending plan as in 16A.14. Uh, this being followed, uh, we would be able to keep the agencies in balance in their budgets and thereby we would not be in a position of them having a deficiency. But the burden and the responsibility would be upon the contracting entity. Senator Latz. Uh, so Mr. President, Senator Kiffmeyer, are you saying then that the language in the bill would only apply to employee compensation and benefits and not to any other uh, expenditure items that might otherwise show, might show up someday in a deficiency request? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President, Senator Latz. Uh, this particular section in this bill is dealing only with that area. The agencies themselves are bound by their spending plans uh, already in state law, and those requirements would be in effect for them. This is in regards to a particular area of contracting. Senator Latz. So, Mr. President, I'm trying to get clarity on which particular area of contracting we're talking about. Are we talking only about employee contracts? Are we talking about collective bargaining agreements for compensation and benefits for employees? Is that the only area that's covered by this particular language? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And so this would not have, um, this would be in regards to salaries and benefits only. So if your reference is to something like offender health care, uh, that is a different area of the statute. And we do have um, an area of our current state law that allows for such situations to be covered in accordance with state law. Senator Latz. So, Mr. President, um, I'm not clear how it is that a state agency would contract for expenditures relating to compensation and benefits um, under current law that would uh, somehow need to be uh, reined in by this new language. Could uh, Senator Kiffmeyer give an example of that? You're asking Senator Kiffmeyer to yield again? Yes, please. Will Senator Kiffmeyer yield? She will yield. 
Thank you, Senator Madam Kiffmeyer. Mr. President. Yes. And so I don't know how often I need to restate uh, or read this language again. Uh, limited by appropriation, a public employer may not contract to pay more to employees in compensation and benefits in a biennium than is permitted under an approved spending plan as provided in Section 16A.14. Senator Latz. Mr. President, forgive me, but I can read the language in the bill. I'm trying to figure out exactly how it will apply. Could Senator Kiffmeyer or anyone who supports this provision or knows about it give me an example, a situation in which such a contract occurred that um, would now be prohibited by this new language if it were to become law? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. And so you have a spending plan, and when you're negotiating a contract, you need to uh, settle that contract of compensation and benefits within that spending plan. So that is a, a limit to that uh, within that spending plan. Senator Latz. Uh, so, Mr. President, Senator Kiffer, I'm going to try to understand this here. What you're saying is if, if an agency were to enter into a contract with its employees, which is essentially a collective bargaining agreement that would somehow provide for expenditure for those employees' compensation and benefits over and above what had been appropriated or approved in the 16A uh, spending plan, then this would prohibit the agency from actually entering that contract or spending any money in compliance with it until we got around to the new budget cycle and they got a new uh, spending plan that was approved under 16A? Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Mr. President, I think uh, Senator Lotz was asking me to yield to that question. All right. He yes, was. Mr. President. He will was. Senator Kiffmeyer yield again? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Kiffmeyer. Um, yes, the uh, language here says you cannot contract to pay more in compensation and benefits than is permitted under an approved spending plan. On the face of it, the language is quite clear. And I think in your last statement, uh, you said so as well. Thank you. Senator Latz. So, Mr. President, it, it, I still haven't been given an example of a situation in which this has actually happened. Um, I mean, wh what's the problem here that's trying to be solved? Um, do we have an example in state government where the, an agency has contracted with employees in a collective bargaining agreement to spend money that they haven't been approved yet and has started to spend that money. I mean, my understanding is they can't spend any of that money until after the legislature has ratified the contracts. Uh, but you know, I, maybe I'm confused here and just reading the bill isn't helping me and I'm sorry, I, I know how to read bill language and if I'm having trouble understanding it, uh, maybe it's just me and the fact that it's now uh, 20 minutes past midnight because we didn't start on any of these agency budget bills until after 7 o'clock this evening. Uh, but I need a little clarification, if I could. And if the chief author of the bill is, is simply going to reread the language in the bill, that doesn't help me any uh, and probably doesn't help the public much either. Uh, is there someone else on the floor who could, I could ask to yield that could give me an example of a situation that's trying to be fixed with this language? Further discussion, Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, I'm going to try to uh, answer Senator Latt's question, at least insofar as I understand the clause uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, Mr. President, if, if Senator Latt's will recall, uh, last year, uh, specifically in the Finance Committee, this issue came up wherein uh, Department of Natural Resources came in with a deficiency budget request of $3 million and the Department of Corrections came in with a deficiency request of $10 million. And in the Finance Committee, so we wound up having to entertain a deficiency request on the part of those two agencies to the tune of $13 million. And what had happened is those two agencies had simply overspent the, the money, the budget, that we had appropriated for them 
to the tune of $13 million, and then came back to us after the fact and asked us to backfill that hole. And in my mind, that is a perfect example of uh, what uh, Senator Kiffmeyer is attempting to, uh, to accomplish in Section 29. That was supplemental funding that uh, I had done my best to deny to the Department of Corrections and to the DNR because I thought it was inappropriate or inappropriate that they would spend more money than what we had appropriated to them. And if we are not going to or be willing to hold our state agencies to the sum of money that we appropriate to them, uh, then what good does it do us if we simply allow them to come back in and we will backfill the hole for them after the fact? So that's the best example, Mr. President, that I could come up with for Senator Latz. Thank you. Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And will Senator Newman yield? He will yield, Senator Latz. Uh, thank you, Senator Newman. I, I really appreciate you giving me something tangible that I can try to understand this with, which is what I've been trying. And I, I remember the discussion that we had last year, and I remember Senator Newman was very active in trying to sort out the issues of the timing of collective bargaining agreements and so on. And, but I don't remember specifically if, for example, the Corrections Department budget and that deficiency request was that related to the timing of the beginning of a collective bargaining agreement, or was that related to, to overtime that was necessary for the corrections, correctional officers uh, to be able to have enough personnel on, on staff with shifts and everything else to make sure that the prisoners were properly uh, uh, protected and so on? Uh, do you remember specifically, Senator Newman? Senator Newman. Mr. President, Senator Latz, my recollection is that insofar as the Department of Corrections was concerned and the $10 million deficiency that they were requesting had to do with employee compensation in the area of overtime. That, that's my recollection. I, I cannot state with certainty that the entire $10 million that they were requesting involved overtime pay. Uh, Senator so, Lapp. So, Mr. President, and I appreciate the body's indulgence as I try to sort this out because um, that's my recollection as well. I'm not going to swear by it, but I mean, that was my recollection as well. And, you know, the Department of Corrections, they incur overtime costs. Uh, most of their expenditure is in their personnel, who are basically prison guards. Uh, and uh, their staff has been running at a 3 to 4 percent vacancy rate, which is about the limit that they have testified to over many years of what is safe for them to be able to operate the prisons, which is that limited vacancy rate. And the higher that vacancy rate, which is def you know, required by whatever we end up appropriating for the agency, um, they have to make sure they have sufficient staff on hand to, uh, to guard the prisoners in, in the prisons. Um, and if they don't have sufficient staff on hand, uh, then it's unsafe for the guards and it's unsafe for the prisoners. Uh, so what you end up with is in order to maintain sufficient coverage for their shifts, they had to pay overtime to get people, uh, you know, employees to come in so they had the coverage because they didn't have the budget to hire enough people to have, say, a 2% vacancy rate, which might have been easier to make sure all the shifts were properly covered without overtime expenditures. Part of my point, I guess, is if this provision had been in effect at the time, the underlying provision in the bill that we're talking about, if it had been in effect at the time, the Department of Corrections would not have been able to pay overtime to its prison guards to make sure that there was adequate staffing levels in the prisons to protect the safety of the guards and the safety of the prisoners. That's the way I'm interpreting the language in the bill. And I think that would be an unsafe situation for us to put our state employees in. Now, it may be a little bit different in some of the other agencies where their daily, day to day work, they're not confronted with guard, uh, guarding people who are spending. 10, 15, 20, 25 year or life sentences for murder and rape and first degree burglary with, with uh, dangerous weapons and so on. 
Uh, but I think we at least ought to exempt the Department of Corrections from this provision, uh, or we're going to have a much bigger problem on our hands than a, than a mere $10 million deficiency request in the next biennium that, uh, that this majority will have to answer to um, if this provision becomes law um, because of their votes. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a, um, as I'm figuring this out, I think this is a dangerous provision in the bill, uh, and uh, I think that supports uh, uh, voting in favor of the amendment to delete uh, Section 29. I'd ask people to support Senator Isaacson's amendment. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, absolutely not true. It is clear from the reading of this language, again, this is about when you contract. When you contract, you are not able to uh, make a contract that would pay more than is permitted under an approved spending plan at the time you contract. The whole point of deficiency, uh, if there is any, is as Senator Limmer said. There are those uh, special times like that, such as you may mention with the Department of Corrections. There are those times where it may necessitate overtime beyond their spending plan. That is exactly what deficiencies are for in those circumstances. And then they come before the legislature to get that approved. We are talking about at the time of contracting uh, that that is in effect. But if there is circumstances, as Senator Limmer said, then certainly go ahead and meet the needs and protect the safety and do all those things that you must do and come before the legislature. Thank you. Senator Latz. Well, Mr. President, now I'm even more confused because if we're not dealing with um, a uh, Department of Corrections deficiency, like Senator Newman was using as an illustration, uh, which I suppose was money that, or obligations that were incurred under an already existing contract, uh, perhaps. I, I, I couldn't tell you that for sure. That's what it sounds like it would be. Um, but if you're saying an agency can't sign a contract for future obligations that would commit it to more than what the legislature has appropriated, well, they can't do that now because all of the contracts that they sign are explicitly conditioned upon the legislature appropriating the funds uh, to be able to pay for them. So then this provision becomes redundant. Uh, so again, I, maybe I'm back now to square one. If, if Senator Kiffmeyer is saying Senator Newman's example doesn't apply here, then where's an example where it does apply? Senator Westrom. Mr. President, it uh, feels like we're on a merry-go-round, maybe. Uh, Senator Latz, Senator Isaacson, uh, you wanted examples, and I think Senator Newman uh, uh, laid it out pretty clear. Uh, I sat in on those same finance committee meetings. Uh, Senator Latz, you sat on that same committee. Uh, we actually uh, had to spend uh, many hours uh, additionally as a committee talking about this, but uh, the issue really gets to be, uh, does the legislature want to get so far down the road after agencies, in that case last year, uh, some of you that uh, just were elected last fall uh, weren't here for that discussion, many of you were, but the legislature had to pass a deficiency budget and we had to find the money. Commissioner France came in uh, upon our request uh, of the committee to kind of walk through this. Uh, what many thought was a broken process because the legislature, it felt like the tail was wagging the dog in the sense that the legislature had approved a certain percentage of increase across the board for most agencies. I think it was about a 1.7 percent increase. As I recall, uh, Senator Latz, it was about a two or two and a half percent uh, agreement that the agencies had agreed to and that contributed to the deficiency subject to the legislature approving it, but that was months later after they had already made, agreed to the agreement and agreed to a number that they knew from the beginning was more than the legislature had just appropriated for that biennium. And that was the, that was the big focus of Commissioner France and uh, the discussion the Finance Committee had. We held up the bill for a, a meeting or two. Uh, because this phenomenon was not the first time, and it was a, a good discussion our committee had because 
Uh, that became the Hobbesian choice of do you go back to the bargaining tables and go through this whole process that had taken months, or do you start just living within the maximum the legislature authorized and not come back to the legislature and say, we're going to put you in this catch-22 and now fund our deficiency because we've agreed to spend more than we had been authorized. So members, it's quite simple. Senator Latz, I think you were there for part of the hearings probably. I know you served on the committee. And uh, anybody that was on the committee, I think, would recall what Senator Newman brought up and uh, the discussions we had in that committee. And that wasn't the first time. It's happened many times before that. And so uh, it's time uh, we do have the authority as a legislature. And I think it's a better process going forward that everybody learns to live within your means. It's no different than building a house. If you've got $250,000, you don't go contract for a $300,000 house and then wonder later how you're going to pay for it. And so, uh, members, I'd urge you to vote no on this amendment. Senator Isaacson. Would uh, Senator Newman yield to a question? Senator Newman will yield. Senator Isaacson. In your um, example, which helped clear this up, did, in your example, the department spend money that we had not appropriated yet? Senator Newman. Mr. President, Senator Isaacson, yes. Senator Isaacson. How? So, um, would, would, would the senator yield to a question again? Senator Newman will yield. Senator Isaacson. If the legislature is the authority that grants the expenditures of money and gave them the money, where did they spend from, or what money did they spend that we had not given them? Senator Newman. Mr. President, uh, Senator Isaacson, I don't know the answer to that question. I can tell you that the legislature appropriated the, uh, a certain sum for them, including a, the <laughs> percentage raise that uh, Senator Westrom had just uh, referred to. After the fact, after they had spent the money, they then came back to the legislature and asked us for an additional $10 million over and above what we had appropriated. Well, Senator Isaacson. Well, thank you. I think we better get the legislative auditor on this. If they're spending money from another source other than the legislature, which is what's being implied right now, or we have to ask ourselves a question in that situation where there's circumstances that warranted it uh, based on the safety and the responsibilities they have in the corrections office. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, we might ask ourselves uh, if agencies are not able to deficit spend, because I don't know of any agency that is able to deficit spend, including corrections. Um, and we had, they came to us and asked us for the $10 million, and you rightly stated that you, uh, uh, Senator Newman, uh, fought against that than that, and had we not approved it, then we would be executing exactly what this bill has already asked us, was asking us to do, which is oversight over expenditures. So again, this bill is an exercise in futility because it doesn't grant us any more powers than we already have. But there's another question I would like to ask. Would Senator Kiffmeyer yield to a question? Senator Kiffmeyer, will you yield? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Thank you. So for the, for the sake of this discussion, let's assume that an agency negotiated a contract that included a 4% raise with the understanding that they would then take on 25% of their insurance costs. If that happened with this language in place, am I correct then in assuming that this, the employee would have to honor the part of the contract that requires them to pay more but would not be given the ability to get the raise. Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Mr. President, uh, this is a hypothetical. And so in a hypothetical situation, as you're saying here, it's about contracting. And so if they have settled the contract for that amount or whatever that may be, and it's in accordance with an approved spending plan as provided here, then that contract would have its effect for whatever that raise, for whatever that may be. Senator Isaacson. Well, would Senator Kiffmeyer yield again? 
Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Kiffmeyer, if we could both just take a look at line 40.6, and it says subdivision two, limited by appropriation, a public employer may not contract to pay more to the employees in compensation and benefits. In the biennium, it doesn't say may not contract to pay less. It doesn't say may not contract to pay anything different. It says may not contract to pay more. And the way I read this would then suggest that if a contract was signed that did pay more, under an approved spending plan, which and make sure I understand that correctly, means the legislature has approved that, or is an approved spending plan say that it has not approved yet? Maybe that's the first question I should ask. Senator what? Kiffmeyer. Uh, Mr. President and Senator Isaacson, uh, it depends upon what you want to ask. If you want to ask that it is spending more or spending less, it just simply says uh, you may not contract to pay more compensation and benefits than is permitted under an approved plan. I don't know how much more clear uh, I can be than that. And so we're not limiting the percentages or the amount of health care premium you would pay. Nothing to do with that whatsoever. All those terms would be included within that contract. The only limit is to stay within the spending plan uh, and not uh, go beyond that spending plan. Would Senator, Senator Kiffmeyer yield another question? Senator Kiffmeyer will yield. Senator Isaacson. Senator Kiffmeyer, can you tell me uh, what is defined as an approved spending plan? Senator Kiffmeyer. Yes, it's defined in section 16A.14. <laughs> so, Isaacson. thank you. What I would want to know then, if anybody can answer the question, is an approved, spoony, uh, approved spending plan designated by the commissioner of the agency or by the legislature? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. President. The agency, uh, the uh, legislature, gives an appropriation, and it is after the appropriation is made and final that then the agency itself would set forward its spending plan under 16A.14. Thank you. So, Senator Isaacson. Thank you. So uh, um, I can appreciate why Senator Kiffmeyer um, is sticking to the messaging on this language but I would have to argue that it's entirely possible that we would be hitting our public employees with a double whammy. If the language of the contract stipulates an increase and then also stipulates that the employee must take on some of the responsibility for paying for the health insurance, which is something we see happening, then the employee will not only not get the increase, but under this language will still pay the extra, extra part of the uh, insurance and why that is problematic is that when the negotiation happened in good faith, more than likely the increase and the insurance were tied together. So we create a problem for ourselves here. Finally, I think what's important <clears throat> to mention is that I had asked what bill this had been heard in a committee and the answer was Senate File 605. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Senate File 605 is the omnibus bill which then does mean indeed it was not heard in committee as a separate bill in language except when we passed the omnibus bill. Now, uh, I realize the chair has a prerogative and the majority has the votes, but I know when the situation's reversed, in fact, I have seen when the situation's reversed that the minority party is never pleased to have language dropped in the last second. It does not lend itself to transparency. It does not lend itself to being an open government process and it looks like it's being added last second hoping nobody will catch it because, in my opinion, this is really about limiting the ability of our state agencies to give our state employees the pay they deserve. And that's what frustrates me about this. So I hope that you will support my amendment. I again appreciate your time. Thank you. Oh, and I'd like a roll call, please. Roll call has been requested. A roll call granted. Further discussion to the A34 amendment. Seeing no further discussion, the secretary will take the roll on the amendment.
All senators having voted a desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 32 ayes and 34 nays, the amendment is not adopted. Further discussion to Senate File 605. The secretary will give the bill its third reading. Senate file number 605, a bill for an act relating to the operation of state government appropriating money. Third reading. Any further discussion? Senator Lane. Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Mr. President. <laughs> Um, I'm going to use some star strong words in the beginning here. This state government bill is irresponsible, short-sighted, and detrimental to the citizens of our great state. These cuts will directly harm Minnesotans. In brief, there are significant staff cuts to almost all of our agencies for no particular reasons. That is, nothing is named as a problem we would like to eliminate. There is just arbitrary overall cuts. And one of these areas includes ignoring our overall state need for cybersecurity. Before I say a bit more about a few of these egregious cuts, I will say there is one bipartisan item in this bill. We will license eyelash technicians. But we cut, cut, cut across state governments in bad times, in deficit times, each agency taking a bit of the heat. We are not in bad times. For over a de decade in the past, we were in more difficult times, and we cut, cut, cut like a broken record, like when the old vinyl record got stuck and repeated, repeated, repeated the same word over and over. Now this broken record metaphor has changed. It's more like we just broke the record into pieces. But in 2011, Governor Dayton ran on raising taxes on the top 2% to structurally balance our budget, and it worked. The work in these agencies is done by people. These cuts simply mean staff reductions, and then who will do the work? We want accountability in all that we do. Who will do that work? There will be less staff to give the support our citizens ask for, and, do, and to do, for instance, the tax auditing. An 11 million cut in revenue will actually cause a 35 million loss to state revenue very short-sighted. I can only begin to touch on some of the uh, consequences to the agencies. MMB, from which we depend for budget forecasts and so much more, is already at a 10-year low in their number of staff. Administration runs the infrastructure of the state for all the agencies. For instance, a negotiation specialist negotiates our contracts, such as the state park reservation system. His expertise has just now saved us considerable money some of which our citizens will see directly in the fee to making a reservation. This bill also increases grant funding, but cuts the staff who administer the grants and keeps the use of the grant money accountable. The Secretary of State has one frontline employee who receives all the calls. During election season, that's 100 calls a day. The cities and counties call her for help. Absentee voting is loved by the people, but it doesn't magically happen. Elections results, we all want them almost instantly. People do that. Testing and certifying our election machine vendors, keeping our voter rolls clean, and we have a presidential primary coming, which will be a third election in an even-numbered year. Somebody has to take responsibility to ready the whole state for this very difficult election, where a voter will need to choose a partisan ballot, and that choice will be public data, very new, who will ready the materials and create this very different type of roster? With a 20% cut, this staff is gone. I use a few, these few examples to show the direct harm to our citizen by these arbitrary cuts. But don't worry, members, we will make sure that racing horses are well cared for by the state in case of a shutdown. They will now be part of the essential service that continues to be funded during a state shutdown, horses before people. I do want to point out two specific items in this bill, campaign finance changes and the lack of funding for cybersecurity. This bill totally eliminates from statute both the public subsidy program for our statewide elections and the PCR, the political campaign refund program. However, it keeps the PCR for political parties. 
and it ends the limits on how much a candidate can spend. I was elected four times to a school board, and I could afford to run those races. I ran for a seat on the city council, and I could afford to do that. When I ran for the House of Representatives in 2006, I could only do that because of the way Minnesota handles campaign finances. I am not wealthy. I needed to depend on other people's contributions, which was helped by the PCR. And I was so appreciative that Minnesota let individual citizens voluntarily choose to check off the box on their taxes to have $5 go to campaign finance public subsidy program and keep our elections open to ordinary citizens like me. That public subsidy, voluntarily created by the people of Minnesota, was a key part of what made it possible for me to run. In 2006, when I ran, the spending limit was 32000 A friend of mine had a cousin running for a similar seat, the House of Representatives, in Texas. It cost her a quarter of a million dollars in the primary and a half a million dollars in the general election, 2006. How many times I have told this story of how proud I am that Minnesota's election financing processes are such that an ordinary citizen like me could run. Now we are joining the states where only the wealthy, or the privately supported, or the party hack can win because the money will be unlimited and the need to be, will be growing far beyond what a public citizen can do on their own. Who can step up to the job will now be limited. This is not what our citizens want. Just ask them. The last thing I want to mention is the lack of funding for cybersecurity. This has been, and there has been an unprecedented number of cyber attacks in the last three to four years across businesses and governments. In 2014, cybercrime was a $575 billion business. It's very well funded and well crafted, and that was 2014 and it's growing exponentially. There are hackers, fraudsters, and even nation states. Their goals are theft, disruption, and destruction. Besides far more sophisticated malware and phishing and identity theft, cybercrime of all sorts is exploding. Criminals comp compromise a system and then monetize it. They shut down a hospital's operating room and demand a ransom that is a profit to the criminals, but not so high that the hospital can't, ha, can hesitate to pay it before the, to get the, just to get the operating room back up and running immediately. Data breaches collect identity information and sell it before you can bat an eye. It's hard to overstate the potential impact to state government if there was a catastrophic breach or takedown of our technology systems. These risks must be recognized in terms of one, their financial impact to the state, two, the ongoing delivery of critical government services, and three, their impact on the public's trust in government. You know, it's actually easy for the criminals. They can do thousands of attacks, and they only have to get it right once. We have to stop, stop every single one of the attacks. Businesses are paying attention to this. The demand for IT experts in cybersecurity is so great as to create a feeding frenzy for the talent. But here we are, in the state of Minnesota, cutting the jobs and keeping salaries low so people can only stay a few years and then they go off to a better paying job. We give a pittance to IT and of that amount we give a pittance to, to security. We need to go out and entice the best to serve here. We need expert people, great tools, great vendors. The state is one of the largest personal data holders, but we are not properly resourced. We have old legacy systems that are hard to protect because they're out of date. And this bill takes from the fund that is dedicated for IT upgrades and replacement products that are projects that are critical to create efficient and secure systems. This taking is like cutting off your nose to spite your face as we leave these projects unfinished and just create additional risk. Pay now or pay later. We will be hacked. We had a 10-day outage of the court system recently. We've had another hack of a major system that was 20 minutes away from disaster when we got control of it. It's just nerve-wracking. Can we afford the costs of remediation, such as covering identity theft services for everyone whose data was stolen? South Carolina's breach cost that state $20 million in one remediation. Minute, Minute secures the private data of 5.5 million Minnesotans. 
They serve all 87 counties, 300 cities, and 200 higher ed campuses. We need vendor services for blocking attacks, penetration testing, and after hours monitoring. We need cybersecurity tools to detect vulnerabilities and intrusion into our state systems. And we need the cybersecurity staff to be able to take action on the information these security tools provide. This is a dangerous and egregious lack in this bill. We must secure our IT. We must properly resource it. With these comments, members, I urge a no vote on this bill. Further discussion, Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. President. The state of Minnesota is in the strongest financial position that it's been for well over a decade. The February state budget forecast revealed a $1.65 billion forecasted surplus, a structurally balanced budget, and the largest cash and budget reserves on record. Our state's strong financial position is the result of a robust Minnesota economy, an educated and productive workforce, smart public investments, and sound state fiscal management under Governor Dayton's leadership. Independent observers, such as financial rating agencies, have given us the best of uh, bond ratings. Governing Magazine and U.S. News and World Report, to name just a few, have all rated Minnesota as an extremely well-run state. Now is the time for Minnesota to remain committed to sound fiscal management and to strengthen, not diminish, the programs and practices that make Minnesota one of the best-run states in the country. Senate File 605 cuts the operating budgets of state agencies from 4 to 7 percent. This arbitrary reduction of agency budgets is an approach that the governor does not support. He has insisted that all proposed budget reductions identify the programs and services that will be cut. This budget does not provide that clarity and I urge a red vote. Thank you. Further discussion, Senator Wickland. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I know it's late, but I um, really felt strongly about speaking uh, a, some additional time about um, cybersecurity. Um, I feel that um, Senator Kiffmeyer has mentioned that there is cybersecurity funding in the budget, um, but I think it's um, seriously underfunded. Minute has developed a foundation to manage the cybersecurity risk. They've gone to um, a lot of work over the past few years to develop a comprehensive policy and standard framework. They've developed an information security strategic plan. It's a five-year plan with milestones. Um, it prioritizes initiatives uh, that relate to the management, protection, and control of the state's information assets. This year, Minute brought forward two initiatives to meet the goals of management protection and control of information assets. They have to do with the Secure Data Center project, uh, requesting $14.6 million for that, and a security program enhancements initiative uh, with a request of $8 million. Uh, due to increasing cybersecurity uh, threats, uh, the, the state is facing daily attacks on critical systems. I believe we need to accelerate our action to implement these initiatives, and I believe there should be a sense of urgency uh, to our response as a legislature due to the extremely sensitive personal nature of, of the data that we store on, on millions of our, our residents. Uh, the current, uh, current budgeted amounts in Senate Files 605 are, are not going to move Minnesota forward in the area of cybersecurity. And it puts us at greater risk of not being able to prevent or respond to attacks that could cost our state um, in terms of harm to citizens um, due to unauthorized access to personal information. It could cost us in reduction in trust by not adequately funding um, cybersecurity to protect uh, citizens' data. Um, it can cost us in terms of lack of availability of services that Minnesotans depend on. And finally, as has been mentioned by um, Senator Lane, uh, it could cause us great expense. Uh, what does a security breach look like? 
Um, as Senator Lane mentioned, the 2012 South Carolina Department of Revenue breach, 3.7 million people were impacted by this breach. Almost 80% of the state population um, was affected. Social security numbers, credit card numbers, debit card numbers were all um, lost and exposed after a hacker um, breached a server in the state's Department of Revenue. In addition, 44 systems were compromised in that, that attack. And as was stated, um, it has cost the state over $20 million, covering identity theft protection services for anyone who paid taxes in the state for the last 20 years. Uh, the language in this bill, um, also, it, it largely it redirects existing IT spending from other critical pro projects. It takes $10 million from a fund that supports IT projects that are currently in progress. These pro projects need to remain in progress and continue forward uh, rather than diverting resources from them. It ties a $2 million general fund provision for cybersecurity to a $3 million personnel cost reduction the following year. It's not even, um, we're not even sure that, that that funding mechanism is even possible given federal cost allocation requirements that, that are used in the IT department. It takes an additional $2.6 million away from the minute base funding to, to, um, to fund cybersecurity, despite the fact that the, the general uh, minute department and GIS systems need um, adequate funding as well. And it puts a requirement that the $14 million provided must be used for data center uh, consolidation and dictates the timeline for doing so. What this means is that there won't be funding available for things like vendor services, advanced cybersecurity tools, and cybersecurity staff. These are all critical functions that need to be happening at the same time that we are doing data center consolidation. We know threats are out there. We hear about them regularly. Um, I had a handout distributed that, it, that discussed some of the, the impacts in Minnesota. And um, even local communities are being uh, impacted by some of these same um, cybersecurity um, scams. The number of threats is growing at a much faster rate than our preparation and implementation of secure network architecture. This is not the time to underfund critical cybersecurity or IT initiatives. I urge members to reject this bill, send it back to revise and allocate appropriate funding for these important initiatives. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion to the bill? Any further discussion? Secretary will take the roll on the bill.
All those senators having voted a desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 36 ayes and 30 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to.